Short Stories by Fyodor Dostoevsky An Honest Thief One morning, just as I was about to set off to my office, Agrafina, my cook, washerwoman, and housekeeper, came in to me and, to my surprise, entered into conversation. She had always been such a silent, simple creature that, except her daily inquiry about dinner, she had not uttered a word for the last six years. I, at least, had heard nothing else from her. "'Here I have come in to have a word with you, sir,' she began abruptly. "'You really ought to let the little room.' "'Which little room?' "'Why, the one next to the kitchen, to be sure.' "'What for?' "'What for? Why, because folks do take in lodgers, to be sure.' "'But who would take it?' "'Who would take it? Why, a lodger would take it, to be sure.' "'But, my good woman, one could not put a bedstead in it. There wouldn't be room to move. Who could live in it?' "'Who wants to live there? As long as he has a place to sleep in, why, he would live in the window.' "'In what window?' "'In what window? As though you didn't know. The one in the passage, to be sure. He would sit there sewing or doing anything else. Maybe he would sit on a chair, too. He's got a chair, and he has a table, too. He's got everything.' "'Who is he, then?' "'Oh, a good man, a man of experience. I will cook for him, and I'll ask him three roubles a month for his board and lodging.' After prolonged efforts, I succeeded at last in learning from Agrafina that an elderly man had somehow managed to persuade her to admit him into the kitchen as a lodger and boarder. Any notion Agrafina took into her head had to be carried out. If not, I knew she would give me no peace. When anything was not to her liking, she at once began to brood and sank into a deep dejection that would last for a fortnight or three weeks— during that period my dinners were spoiled, my linen was mislaid, my floors went unscrubbed. In short, I had a great deal to put up with. I had observed long ago that this inarticulate woman was incapable of conceiving a project, of originating an idea of her own. But if anything like a notion or a project was by some means put into her feeble brain, to prevent its being carried out meant, for a time, her moral assassination." And so, as I cared more for my peace of mind than for anything else, I consented forthwith. Has he a passport, anyway, or something of the sort? To be sure he has. He is a good man, a man of experience. Three roubles he's promised to pay. The very next day, the new lodger made his appearance in my modest bachelor quarters, but I was not put out by this. Indeed, I was inwardly pleased. I lead, as a rule, a very lonely hermit's existence. I have scarcely any friends. I hardly ever go anywhere. As I had spent ten years never coming out of my shell, I had, of course, grown used to solitude. But another ten or fifteen years or more of the same solitary existence, with the same Agrafina, in the same bachelor quarters, was, in truth, a somewhat cheerless prospect, and therefore a new inmate, if well-behaved, was a heaven-sent blessing. Agrafina had spoken truly. My lodger was certainly a man of experience. From his passport it appeared that he was an old soldier, a fact which I should have known indeed from his face. An old soldier is easily recognized. Astafi Ivanovich was a favorable specimen of his class. We got on very well together— what was best of all, Astafi Ivanovich would sometimes tell a story, describing some incident in his own life. In the perpetual boredom of my existence, such a storyteller was a veritable treasure. One day he told me one of these stories. It made an impression on me. The following event was what led to it. I was left alone in the flat. Both Astafi and Agrafina were out on business of their own, all of a sudden I heard from the inner room somebody, I fancied a stranger, come in. I went out. There actually was a stranger in the passage, a short fellow wearing no overcoat in spite of the cold autumn weather. 
What do you want? Does a clerk called Alexandrov live here? Nobody of that name here, brother. Goodbye. Why, the Dvornik told me it was here, said my visitor, cautiously retiring towards the door. Be off. Be off, brother. Get along. Next day after dinner, while Astavi Ivanovich was fitting on a coat which he was altering for me, again someone came into the passage. I half opened the door. Before my very eyes, my yesterday's visitor, with perfect composure, took my wadded greatcoat from the peg, and stuffing it under his arm, darted out of the flat. Agrafina stood all the time staring at him, agape with astonishment and doing nothing for the protection of my property. Astafi Ivanovich flew in pursuit of the thief, and ten minutes later came back out of breath and empty-handed. He had vanished completely. Well, there's a piece of luck, Astafi Ivanovich. It's a good job your cloak is left, or he would have put you in a plight, the thief. But the whole incident had so impressed Astafi Ivanovich that I forgot the theft as I looked at him. He could not get over it. Every minute or two he would drop the work upon which he was engaged and would describe over again how it all happened, how he had been standing, how the great coat had been taken down before his very eyes not a yard away, and how it had come to pass that he could not catch the thief. Then he would sit down to his work again and leave it once more, and at last I saw him go down to the Dvornik and tell him all about it, and to upbraid him for letting such a thing happen in his domain. Then he came back and began scolding Agrafina. Then he sat down to his work again, and long afterwards he was still muttering to himself how it had all happened, how he stood there, and I was here, how before our eyes, not a yard away, the thief took the coat off the peg, and so on. In short, though Astafi Ivanovich understood his business, he was a terrible slow coach and busybody. He's made fools of us, Astafi Ivanovich. I said to him in the evening, as I gave him a glass of tea. I wanted to while away the time by recalling the story of the lost greatcoat, the frequent repetition of which, together with the great earnestness of the speaker, was beginning to become very amusing. Fools indeed, sir! Even though it is no business of mine, I am put out. It makes me angry, though it is not my coat that was lost. To my thinking, there is no vermin in the world worse than a thief. Another takes what you can spare, but a thief steals the work of your hands, the sweat of your brow, your time. Ugh! It's nasty. One can't speak of it. It's too vexing. How is it you don't feel the loss of your property, sir? Yes, you are right, Astafi Ivanovich. Better if the thing had been burnt. It's annoying to let the thief have it. It's disagreeable. Disagreeable? I should think so. Yet, to be sure, there are thieves and thieves. And I have happened, sir, to come across an honest thief. An honest thief? But how can a thief be honest, Astafi Ivanovich? There you are right indeed, sir. How can a thief be honest? There are none such. I only meant to say that he was an honest man, sure enough, and yet he stole. I was simply sorry for him. Why, how was that, Astafi Ivanovich? It was about two years ago, sir. I had been nearly a year out of a place, and just before I lost my place I made the acquaintance of a poor lost creature. We got acquainted in a public house— he was a drunkard, a vagrant, a beggar. He had been in a situation of some sort, but from his drinking habits he had lost his work. Such a near-do-well. God only knows what he had on. Often you wouldn't be sure if he'd a shirt under his coat. Everything he could lay his hands upon he would drink away. But he was not one to quarrel. He was a quiet fellow, a soft, good-natured chap. And he'd never ask, he was ashamed, but you could see for yourself the poor fellow wanted a drink, and you would stand at him. 
and so we got friendly, that's to say, he stuck to me. It was all one to me. And what a man he was, to be sure. Like a little dog he would follow me, wherever I went, there he would be, and all that after our first meeting, and he as thin as a thread paper. At first it was, let me stay the night. Well, I let him stay. I looked at his passport, too. The man was all right. Well, the next day it was the same story, and then the third day he came again, and sat all day in the window and stayed the night. Well, thinks I, he is sticking to me. Give him food and drink and shelter at night, too. Here I am, a poor man, and a hanger-on to keep as well. And before he came to me he used to go in the same way to a government clerk's. He attached himself to him. They were always drinking together, but he, through trouble of some sort, drank himself into the grave. My man was called Emelian Ilyich. I pondered and pondered what I was to do with him. To drive him away I was ashamed. I was sorry for him. Such a pitiful, God-forsaken creature I never did set eyes on. And not a word said either. He does not ask, but just sits there and looks into your eyes like a dog. To think what drinking will bring a man down to. I kept asking myself, how am I to say to him, You must be moving, Emelianushka. There's nothing for you here. You've come to the wrong place. I shall soon not have a bite for myself. How am I to keep you, too? I sat and wondered what he'd do when I said that to him, and I seemed to see how he'd stare at me, if he were to hear me say that, how long he would sit and not understand a word of it, and when it did get home to him at last, how he would get up from the window, would take up his bundle. I can see it now, the red check handkerchief full of holes, with God knows what wrapped up in it, which he had always with him, and then how he would set his shabby old coat to rights, so that it would look decent and keep him warm, so that no holes would be seen. He was a man of delicate feelings, and how he'd open the door and go out with tears in his eyes. Well, there's no letting a man go to ruin like that. One's sorry for him. And then again, I'd think, how am I off myself? Wait a bit. Emelianushka, says I to myself, you've not long to feast with me. I shall soon be going away, and then you will not find me. Well, sir, our family made a move, and Alexander Filimonovitch, my master, now deceased, God rest his soul, said, I am thoroughly satisfied with you, Astafi Ivanovitch. When we come back from the country, we will take you on again. I had been butler with them. A nice gentleman he was, but he died that same year. Well, after seeing him off, I took my belongings. What little money I had, and I thought I'd have a rest for a time. So I went to an old woman I knew, and I took a corner in her room. There was only one corner free in it. She had been a nurse, so now she had a pension and a room of her own. Well, now good-bye, Emil Yanushka thinks I. You won't find me now, my boy. And what do you think, sir? I had gone out to see a man I knew, and when I came back in the evening, the first thing I saw was Emelianushka. There he was, sitting on my box, and his check bundle beside him. He was sitting in his ragged old coat, waiting for me. And to while away the time, he had borrowed a church book from the old lady, and was holding it wrong side upwards. He'd scented me out. My heart sank. Well, thinks I, there's no help for it. Why didn't I turn him out at first? So I asked him straight off. Have you brought your passport, Emelianushka? I sat down on the spot, sir, and began to ponder. Will a vagabond like that be very much trouble to me? And on thinking it over, it seemed he would not be much trouble. He must be fed, I thought. Well, a bit of bread in the morning, and to make it go down better, I'll buy him an onion. 
At midday I should have to give him another bit of bread and an onion, and in the evening onion again with kvass, with some more bread if he wanted it. And if some cabbage soup were to come our way, then we should both have had our fill. I am no great eater myself, and a drinking man, as we all know, never eats. All he wants is herb brandy or green vodka. He'll ruin me with his drinking, I thought, but then another idea came into my head, sir, and took great hold on me. So much so that if Emelianushka had gone away, I should have felt that I had done nothing to live for, I do believe. I determined on the spot to be a father and guardian to him. I'll keep him from ruin, I thought. I'll wean him from the glass. You wait a bit, thought I. Very well, Emelianushka. You may stay. Only you must behave yourself. You must obey orders. Well, thinks I to myself, I'll begin by training him to work of some sort, but not all at once. Let him enjoy himself a little first, and I'll look round and find something you are fit for, Emelianushka. For every sort of work a man needs a special ability, you know, sir. And I began to watch him on the quiet. I soon saw Emelianushka was a desperate character. I began, sir, with a word of advice. I said this and that to him. Emelianushka, said I, you ought to take a thought and mend your ways. Have done with drinking. Just look what rags you go about in. That old coat of yours, if I may make bold to say so, is fit for nothing but a sieve. A pretty state of things. It's time to draw the line, sure enough. Emelianushka sat and listened to me with his head hanging down. Would you believe it, sir? It had come to such a pass with him, he'd lost his tongue through drink and could not speak a word of sense. Talk to him of cucumbers and he'd answer back about beans. He would listen and listen to me and then heave such a sigh. "'What are you sighing for, Emelian Ilyich? I asked him. "'Oh, nothing, don't you mind me, Astafy Ivanovitch. "'Do you know there were two women fighting in the street today, Astafy Ivanovitch? "'One upset the other woman's basket of cranberries by accident.' "'Well, what of that?' "'And the second one upset the other's cranberries on purpose "'and trampled them underfoot, too.' "'Well, and what of it, Emelian Ilyich? "'Why, nothing, Astafy Ivanovitch, I just mentioned it. "'Nothing, I just mentioned it. "'Emelianushka, my boy, I thought you've squandered and drunk away your brains.' "'And do you know a gentleman dropped a money note on the pavement in Gohova Street? "'No, it was Sadovi Street.' And a peasant saw it and said, that's my luck, and at the same time another man saw it and said, no, it's my bit of luck, I saw it before you did. Well, Emelian Ilyich. And the fellows had a fight over it, Astafy Ivanovich. But a policeman came up, took away the note, gave it back to the gentleman, and threatened to take up both men. <sighs> well, but what of that? What is there edifying about it, Emelianushka? Why, nothing to be sure, folks laughed, Astafy Ivanovitch. Ah, Emelianushka, what do the folks matter? You've sold your soul for a brass farthing. But do you know what I have to tell you, Emelian Ilyich? What, Astafy Ivanovitch? Take a job of some sort. That's what you must do. For the hundredth time, I say to you, set to work. Have some mercy on yourself. What could I set to, Astafy Ivanovitch? I don't know what job I could set to, and there is no one who will take me on, Astafy Ivanovitch. That's how you came to be turned off, Emelianushka, you drinking man. And do you know... Vlas, the waiter, was sent for to the office today, Astafy Ivanovitch. Why did they send for him, Emelianushka? I asked. I could not say why, Astafy Ivanovitch. I suppose they wanted him there, and that's why they sent for him. Ah, uh, uh, thought I, 
We are in a bad way, poor Emelianushka. The Lord is chastising us for our sins. Well, sir, what is one to do with such a man? But a cunning fellow he was, and no mistake. He'd listen and listen to me, but at last I suppose he got sick of it. As soon as he sees I'm beginning to get angry, he'd pick up his old coat and out he'd slip and leave no trace. He'd wander about all day and come back at night drunk. Where he got the money from, the Lord only knows. I had no hand in that. No, said I. Emelian Ilyich, you'll come to a bad end. Give over drinking, mind what I say now. Give it up. Next time you come home in liquor, you can spend the night on the stairs. I won't let you in. After hearing that threat, Emelianushka sat at home that day and the next, but on the third he slipped off again. I waited and waited. He didn't come back. Well, at least I don't mind owning. I was in a fright, and I felt for the man, too. What have I done to him? I thought. I've scared him away. Where's the poor fellow gone to now? He'll get lost, maybe. Lord, have mercy upon us. Night came on. He did not come. In the morning I went out into the porch. I looked, and if he hadn't gone to sleep in the porch, there he was with his head on the step and chilled to the marrow of his bones. What next, Emelianushka? God have mercy on you. Where will you get to next? Why, you were sort of angry with me, Astafi Ivanovitch, the other day. You were vexed and promised to put me to sleep in the porch, so I didn't sort of venture to come in, Astafi Ivanovitch, and so I lay down here. I did feel angry. And sorry, too. Surely. You might undertake some other duty, Emelianushka, instead of lying here guarding the steps, I said. Why, what other duty, Astafi Ivanovitch? You lost soul. I was in such a rage. I called him that. If you could but learn tailoring work. Look at your old rag of a coat. It's not enough to have it in tatters. Here you are sweeping the steps with it. You might take a needle and boggle up your rags as decency demands. Ah, you drunken man! What do you think, sir? He actually did take a needle. Of course, I said it in jest, but he was so scared he set to work. He took off his coat and began threading the needle. I watched him, as you may well guess. His eyes were all red and bleary, and his hands were all of a shake. He kept shoving and shoving the thread and could not get it through the eye of the needle. He kept screwing his eyes up and wetting the thread and twisting it in his fingers. It was no good. He gave it up and looked at me. Well, said I, this is a nice way to treat me. If there had been folks by to see, I don't know what I should have done. <laughs> Why, you simple fellow, I said it to you in a joke, as a reproach. Give over your nonsense. God bless you, sir. Sit quiet and don't put me to shame. Don't sleep on my stairs and make a laughing stock of me. Why, what am I to do, Astafi Ivanovitch? I know very well I am a drunkard and good for nothing. I can do nothing but vex you, my bene... benefactor. And all that his blue lips began all of a sudden to quiver, and a tear ran down his white cheek and trembled on his stubbly chin, and then poor Emelianushka burst into a regular flood of tears. Mercy on us! I felt as though a knife were thrust into my heart. The sensitive creature. I'd never have expected it. Who could have guessed it? No. Emelianushka, thought I. I shall give you up altogether. You can go your way like the rubbish you are. Well, sir, why make a long story of it? 
"'And the whole affair is so trifling it's not worth wasting words upon. "'Why, you, for instance, sir, would not have given a thought to it, "'but I would have given a great deal, if I had a great deal to give, "'that it never should have happened at all. "'I had a pair of riding breeches by me, sir. "'Deuce take them. Fine. First-rate riding breeches they were, too. "'Blue with a check on it. "'They'd been ordered by a gentleman from the country, but... He would not have them, after all, said they were not fool enough, so they were left on my hands. It struck me that they were worth something. At the second-hand dealers I ought to get five silver roubles for them, or if not I could turn them into two pairs of trousers for Petersburg gentlemen and have a piece over for a waistcoat for myself. Of course, for poor people like us everything comes in, and it happened just then that— Emelyanushka was having a sad time of it. There he sat day after day. He did not drink. Not a drop passed his lips. But he sat and moped like an owl. It was sad to see him. He just sat and brooded. Well, thought I, either you've got not a copper to spend, my lad, or else you're turning over a new leaf of yourself. You've given it up. You've listened to reason." Well, sir, that's how it was with us, and just then came a holiday. I went to Vespers, and when I came home I found Emelianushka sitting in the window, drunk and rocking to and fro. Ah, so that's what you've been up to, my lad, and I went to get something out of my chest, and when I looked in, the breeches were not there. I rummaged here and there. They'd vanished. When I ransacked everywhere and saw they were not there, something seemed to stab me to the heart. I ran first to the old dame and began accusing her. Of Emelianushka I'd not the faintest suspicion, though there was cause for it in his sitting there drunk. No, said the old body, God be with you, my fine gentleman. What good are riding breeches to me? Am I going to wear such things? Why— a skirt I had I lost the other day through a fellow of your sort. I know nothing. I can tell you nothing about it, she said. Who has been here? Who has been in? I asked. Why, nobody has been in, my good sir, says she. I've been here all the while. Emelian Ilyich went out and came back again. There he sits. Ask him. Emelianushka, said I. Have you taken those new riding breeches for anything? You remember the pair I made for that gentleman from the country? No, Astafy Ivanovitch, said he. I've not, sort of, touched them. I was in a state. I hunted high and low for them. They were nowhere to be found, and Emilia Nushka sits there rocking himself to and fro. I was squatting on my heels facing him and bending over the chest— and all at once I stole a glance at him. Alack, I thought. My heart suddenly grew hot within me, and I felt myself flushing up too, and suddenly Amelia Nushka looked at me. No, Ashtafi Ivanovitch, said he, those riding breeches of yours, maybe you are thinking, maybe I took them, but I never touched them. But what can have become of them, Emelian Ilyich? No, Astafy Ivanovitch, said he, I've never seen them. Why, Emelian Ilyich, I suppose they've run off of themselves, eh? Maybe they have, Astafy Ivanovitch. When I heard him say that, I got up at once, went up to him, lighted the lamp, and sat down to work to my sewing. I was altering a waistcoat for a clerk who lived below us, and wasn't there a burning pain and ache in my breast. I shouldn't have minded so much if I had put all the clothes I had in the fire. Emelianushka seemed to have an inkling of what a rage I was in. When a man is guilty, you know, sir, he scents trouble far off, like the birds of the air before a storm. Do you know what, Astafy Ivanovitch? Emelianushka began, and his poor old voice was shaking as he said the words. 
Antip Prohorich, the apothecary, married the coachman's wife this morning, who died the other day. <sighs> I did give him a look, sir, a nasty look it was. Emilia Nushka understood it, too. I saw him get up, go to the bed, and begin to rummage there for something. I waited. He was busy there a long time and kept muttering all the while. No, not there. Where can the blessed things have got to? I waited to see what he'd do. I saw him creep under the bed on all fours. I couldn't bear it any longer. What are you crawling about under the bed for, Emelian Ilyich? said I. Looking for the breeches of Staffy Ivanovich. Maybe they've dropped down there somewhere. Why should you try to help a poor simple man like me? said I, crawling on your knees for nothing, sir. I called him that in my vexation. Oh, never mind, Astafy Ivanovich, I'll just look. They'll turn up maybe somewhere. Hm, said I. Look here, Emelian Ilyich. What is it, Astafy Ivanovich? said he. Haven't you simply stolen them from me like a thief and a robber, in return for the bread and salt you've eaten here? said I. I felt so angry, sir, at seeing him fooling about on his knees before me. No, Astafy Ivanovich. And he stayed lying as he was on his face under the bed. A long time he lay there, and then at last crept out. I looked at him, and the man was as white as a sheet. He stood up and sat down near me in the window and sat for some ten minutes. No, Astafy Ivanovich, he said. And all at once he stood up and came towards me, and I can see him now. He looked dreadful. No, Astafy Ivanovich, he said he. I never sort of touched your breeches. He was all of a shake, poking himself in the chest with a trembling finger, and his poor old voice shook so that I was frightened, sir and sat, though I was rooted to the window-seat. "'Well, Emelian Ilyich,' said I, "'as you will. Forgive me if I, in my foolishness, have accused you unjustly. As for the breeches, let them go hang. We can live without them. We still are hands, thank God. We need not go thieving or begging from some other poor man. We'll earn our bread.' Emelianushka heard me out and went on standing there before me. I looked up, and he had sat down, and there he sat all the evening without stirring. At last I lay down to sleep. Emelianushka went on sitting in the same place. When I looked out in the morning, he was lying curled up in his old coat on the bare floor. He felt too crushed even to come to bed. Well, sir... I felt no more liking for the fellow from that day. In fact, for the first few days, I hated him. I felt as if one may say as though my own son had robbed me and done me a deadly hurt. Ah, thought I, Emelianushka, Emelianushka. And Emelianushka, sir, went on drinking for a whole fortnight without stopping. He was drunk all the time and regularly besought it. He went out in the morning and came back late at night, and for a whole fortnight I didn't get a word out of him. It was as though grief was gnawing at his heart, or as though he wanted to do something for himself completely. At last he stopped. He must have come to the end of all he'd got. And then he sat in the window again. I remember he sat there without speaking for three days and three nights. All of a sudden I saw that he was crying. He was just sitting there, sir, and crying like anything, a perfect stream, as though he didn't know how his tears were flowing. And it's a sad thing, sir, to see a grown-up man, and an old man, too, crying from woe and grief. "'What's the matter, Emelianushka? said I. He began to tremble so that he shook all over. I spoke to him for the first time since that evening. Nothing, Astafy Ivanovich. 
God be with you, Amelia Nushka. What's lost is lost. Why are you moping about like this? I felt sorry for him. Oh, nothing, Astafy Ivanovitch, it's no matter. I want to find some work to do, Astafy Ivanovitch. And what sort of work, pray, Emilianushka? Why, any sort. Perhaps I could find a situation such as I used to have. I've been all ready to ask Fedose Ivanitch. I don't like to be a burden on you, Astafy Ivanovitch. If I can find a situation, Astafy Ivanovitch, then I'll pay it you all back and make you a return for all your hospitality. Enough, Emilianushka, enough! Let bygones be bygones, and no more to be said about it. Let us go on as we used to do before. No, Astafy Ivanovitch, you maybe think. But I uh, never touched your riding breeches. Well, have it your own way. God be with you, Emilianushka. No, Astafy Ivanovitch, I can't go on living with you. That's clear. You must excuse me, Astafy Ivanovitch. Why, God bless you, Emilian Ilyich. Who's offending you and driving you out of the place? Am I doing it? No, it's not the proper thing for me to live with you like this, Astafy Ivanovitch. I'd better be going. He was so hurt, it seemed. He stuck to his point. I looked at him, and sure enough, up he got and pulled his old coat over his shoulders. But where are you going, Emilian Ilyich? Listen to reason. What are you about? Where are you off to? No, good-bye, Astafy Ivanovitch. Don't keep me now. And he was blubbering again. I'd better be going. You're not the same now. Not the same as what? I am the same. But you'll be lost by yourself like a poor helpless babe, Emilian Ilyich. No, Astafy Ivanovitch, when you go out now, you lock up your chest, and it makes me cry to see it, Astafy Ivanovitch. You'd better let me go, Astafy Ivanovitch, and forgive me all the trouble I've given you while I've been living with you. Well, sir, the man went away. I waited for a day. I expected he'd be back in the evening. No. Next day, no sign of him nor the third day either. I began to get frightened. I was so worried I couldn't drink, I couldn't eat, I couldn't sleep. The fellow had quite disarmed me. On the fourth day I went out to look for him. I peeped into all the taverns to inquire for him, but no, Emilia Nushka was lost. Have you managed to keep yourself alive, Emilia Nushka? I wondered. Perhaps he is lying dead under some hedge. Poor drunkard, like a sodden log. I went home more dead than alive. Next day I went out to look for him again, and I kept cursing myself that I'd been such a fool as to let the man go off by himself. On the fifth day it was a holiday. In the early morning I heard the door creak. I looked up, and there was my Emilia Nushka coming in. His face was blue, and his hair was covered with dirt as though he'd been sleeping in the street. He was as thin as a match. He took off his old coat, sat down on the chest, and looked at me. I was delighted to see him, but I felt more upset about him than ever. For you see, sir, if I'd been overtaken in some sin, as true as I am here, sir, I'd have died like a dog before I'd have come back. But Amelia Nushka did come back, and a sad thing it was, sure enough, to see a man sunk so low. I began to look after him, to talk kindly to him, to comfort him. Well, Amelia Nushka, said I, I am glad you've come back. Had you been away much longer, I should have gone to look for you in the taverns again today. Are you hungry? No, Astafy Ivanovitch. Come now, aren't you really? Here, brother, is some cabbage soup left over from yesterday. 
There was meat in it. It is good stuff. And here is some bread and onion. Come, eat it. It'll do you no harm. I made him eat it. And I saw at once that the man had not tasted food for maybe three days. He was as hungry as a wolf. So it was hunger that had driven him to me. My heart was melted looking at the poor deer. Let me run to the tavern, thought I. I'll get something to ease his heart, and then we'll make an end of it. I've no more anger in my heart against you, Emilia Nushka. I brought him some vodka. Here, Emilian Ilyich, let us have a drink for the holiday. Like a drink, it will do you good. He held out his hand, held it out greedily. He was just taking it, and then he stopped himself. But a minute after I saw him take it and lift it to his mouth, spilling it on his sleeve. But though he got it to his lips, he set it down on the table again. What is it, Emilianushka? Nothing, Astafy Ivanovitch. I sort of... Won't you drink it? Oh, Astafy Ivanovitch, I'm not uh, sort of going to drink any more Astafy Ivanovitch. Do you mean you've given it up altogether, Emilianushka? Or are you only not going to drink today? He did not answer. A minute later I saw him rest his head on his hand. What's the matter, Emilianushka? Are you ill? Why, yes, Astafy Ivanovitch, I don't feel well. I took him and laid him down on the bed. I saw that he really was ill. His head was burning hot, and he was shivering with fever. I sat by him all day. Toward night, he was worse. I mixed him some oil and onion and kvass and bread broken up. Come, eat some of this, said I, and perhaps you'll feel better. He shook his head. No, said he, I won't have any dinner today, Astafy Ivanovitch. I made some tea for him. I quite flustered our old woman. He was no better. Well, thinks I, it's a bad lookout. The third morning I went for a medical gentleman. There was one I knew living close by, Kosta Pravov by name. I'd made his acquaintance when I was in service with the Bazamyagans. He attended me. The doctor come and looked at him. He's in a bad way, said he. It was no use sending for me, but if you like I can give him a powder. Well, I didn't give him a powder. I thought that's just the doctor's little game. And then the fifth day came. He lay, sir. Dying before my eyes, I sat in the window with my work in my hands. The old woman was heating the stove. We were all silent. My heart was simply breaking over him, the good-for-nothing fellow. I felt as if it were a son of my own I was losing. I knew that Emilianushka was looking at me. I'd seen the man all the day long making up his mind to say something— and not daring to. At last I looked up at him. I saw such misery in the poor fellow's eyes. He had kept them fixed on me, but when he saw that I was looking at him, he looked down at once. Astafy Ivanovitch? What is it, Emilianushka? If you were to take my old coat to a second-hand dealer's, how much do you think they'd give you for it, Astafy Ivanovitch? There's no knowing how much they'd give. Maybe they would give me a rouble for it, Emilian Ilyich. But if I had taken it, they wouldn't have given a farthing for it, but would have laughed in my face for bringing such a trumpery thing. I simply said that to comfort the poor fellow, knowing the simpleton he was. But I was thinking, Astafy Ivanovitch, they might give you three roubles for it. It's made of cloth, Astafy Ivanovitch. How could they only give one rouble for a cloth coat? I don't know, Emilian Ilyich, said I. If you are thinking of taking it, you should certainly ask three roubles to begin with. 
Emelianushka was silent for a time, and then he addressed me again. Astafy Ivanovitch. What is it, Emelianushka? I asked. Sell my coat when I die, and don't bury me in it. I can lie as well without it, and it's a thing of some value. It might come in useful. I can't tell you how it made my heart ache to hear him. I saw that the death agony was coming on him. We were silent again for a bit, so an hour passed by. I looked at him again. He was still staring at me, and when he met my eyes he looked down again. Do you want some water to drink, Emilian Ilyich? I asked. Give me some. God bless you, Estafi Ivanovich. I gave him a drink. Thank you, Estafi Ivanovich, said he. Is there anything else you would like, Emilianushka? No, Estafi Ivanovich. There's nothing I want, but I... sort of. What? I only... What is it, Emelianushka? Those riding breeches. It was sort of I who took them, Astafi Ivanovitch. Well, God forgive you, Emelianushka, said I. You poor, sorrowful creature. Depart in peace. And I was choking myself, sir and the tears were in my eyes. I turned aside for a moment. Astafy Ivanovitch. I saw Emelianushka wanted to tell me something. He was trying to sit up, trying to speak, and mumbling something. He flushed red all over suddenly, looked at me. Then I saw him turn white again. Whiter and whiter and he seemed to sink away all in a minute. His head fell back. He drew one breath and gave up his soul to God. A Novel in Nine Letters 1. From Pyotr Ivanich to Ivan Petrovich Dear Sir and Most Precious Friend Ivan Petrovich, For the last two days I have been, I may say, in pursuit of you, my friend, having to talk over most urgent business with you, and I cannot come across you anywhere. Yesterday, while we were at Semyon Alexeyevich's, my wife made a very good joke about you, saying that Tatyana Petrovna and you were a pair of birds always on the wing. You have not been married three months, and you already neglect your domestic hearth. We all laughed heartily, from our genuine kindly feeling for you, of course, but joking apart, my precious friend... You have given me a lot of trouble. Semyon Alexievich said to me that you might be going to the ball at the Social Union's club. Leaving my wife with Semyon Alexievich's good lady, I flew off to the Social Union. It was funny and tragic. Fancy my position. Me at the ball and alone, without my wife. Ivan Andreyitch, meeting me in the porter's lodge and seeing me alone, at once concluded, the rascal, that I had a passion for dances, and, taking me by the arm, wanted to drag me off by force to a dancing class, saying that it was too crowded at the social union, that an ardent spirit had not room to turn, and that his head ached from the patchouli and mignonette. I found neither you nor Tatyana Petrovna. Ivan Andreyitch vowed and declared that you would be at Woe from Wit at the Alexandrinsky Theatre, I flew off to the Alexandrinsky Theatre. You were not there either. This morning I expected to find you at Chesnokinov's. No sign of you there. Chesnokinov sent to the Parapalkins. The same thing there. In fact, I am quite worn out. You can judge how much trouble I have taken. Now I am writing you. There is nothing else I can do. My business is by no means a literary one. You understand me? It would be better to meet face to face. It is extremely necessary to discuss something with you, and as quickly as possible. 
and so I beg you to come to us today with Tatyana Petrovna to tea and for a chat in the evening. My Anna Mihalovna will be extremely pleased to see you. You will truly, as they say, oblige me to my dying day. By the way, my precious friend, since I have taken up my pen, I'll go into all I have against you. I have a slight complaint I must make. In fact, I must reproach you, my worthy friend, for an apparently very innocent little trick which you have played at my expense. You are a rascal, a man without conscience. About the middle of last month, you brought into my house an acquaintance of yours, Yevgeny Nikolaitch. You vouched for him by your friendly and, for me, of course, sacred recommendation. I rejoiced at the opportunity of receiving the young man with open arms, and when I did so, I put my head in a noose. A noose it hardly is, but it has turned out a pretty business. I have not time now to explain, and indeed it is an awkward thing to do in writing. Only a very humble request to you, my malicious friend. Could you not somehow very delicately, in passing, drop a hint into the young man's ear that there are a great many houses in the metropolis besides ours? It is more than I can stand, my dear fellow. We fall at your feet, as our friend Semyonovitch says. I will tell you all about it when we meet. I don't mean to say that the young man has sinned against good manners, or is lacking in spiritual qualities, or is not up to the mark in some other way. On the contrary, he is an amiable and pleasant fellow. But wait, we shall meet. Meanwhile, if you see him, for goodness' sake, whisper a hint to him, my good friend. I would do it myself, but you know what I am. I simply can't, and that's all about it. You introduced him, but I will explain myself more fully this evening, anyway. Now good-bye, I remain, etc. P.S. My little boy has been ailing for the last week and gets worse and worse every day. He is cutting his poor little teeth. My wife is nursing him all the time and is depressed, poor thing. Be sure to come. You will give us real pleasure, my precious friend. 2. From Ivan Petrovitch to Pyotr Ivanitch. Dear Sir Pyotr Ivanitch, I got your letter yesterday. I read it and was perplexed. You looked for me, goodness knows where, and I was simply at home. Till ten o'clock I was expecting Ivan Ivanitch Tolokhnov. At once, on getting your letter, I set out with my wife. I went to the expense of taking a cab and reached your house about half-past six. You were not at home, but we were met by your wife. I waited to see you till half-past ten. I could not stay later. I set off with my wife, went to the expense of a cab again, saw her home, and went on myself to the Parapalkins, thinking I might meet you there. But again I was out in my reckoning. When I get home I did not sleep all night. I felt uneasy. In the morning I drove round to you three times at nine, at ten, and at eleven. Three times I went to the expense of a cab, and again you left me in the lurch. I read your letter and was amazed. You write about Yevgeny Nikolaitch. Beg me to whisper some hint and do not tell me what about. I commend your caution, but all letters are not alike, and I don't give documents of importance to my wife for curl papers. I am puzzled, in fact, to know with what motive you wrote all this to me. However, if it comes to that, why should I meddle in the matter? I don't poke my nose into other people's business. You can be not at home to him. I only see that I must have a brief and decisive explanation with you. And moreover, time is passing, and I am in straits and don't know what to do if you are going to neglect the terms of our agreement. A journey for nothing. A journey costs something, too, and my wife's whining for me to get her a velvet mantle of the latest fashion. About Yevgeny Nikolaitch, I hasten to mention that when I was at Pavel Semyonovich Parapolkins yesterday, I made inquiries without loss of time. He has five hundred serfs in the province of Yaroslav, and he has expectations from his grandmother of an estate of three hundred serfs near Moscow. How much money he has, I cannot tell, 
I think you ought to know that better. I beg you once for all to appoint a place where I can meet you. You met Ivan Andreyitch yesterday, and you write that he told you I was at the Alexandrinsky Theatre with my wife. I write that he is a liar, and it shows how little he is to be trusted in such cases, that only the day before yesterday he did his grandmother out of eight hundred roubles. I have the honor to remain, etc. P.S. My wife is going to have a baby. She is nervous about it and feels depressed at times. At the theater they sometimes have firearms going off and sham thunderstorms. And so, for fear of a shock to my wife's nerves, I do not take her to the theater. I have no great partiality for the theater myself. 3. From Pyotr Ivanich to Ivan Petrovich My precious friend Ivan Petrovich, I am to blame, to blame a thousand times to blame, but I hasten to defend myself. Between five and six yesterday, just as we were talking of you with the warmest affection, a messenger from Uncle Stepan Alexeyitch galloped up with the news that my aunt was very bad. Being afraid of alarming my wife, I did not say a word of this to her, but on the pretext of other urgent business I drove off to my aunt's house. I found her almost dying. Just at five o'clock she had had a stroke, the third she has had in the last two years. Karl Fyodorich, their family doctor, told us that she might not live through the night. You can judge of my position, dearest friend. We were on our legs all night in grief and anxiety. It was not till morning that, utterly exhausted and overcome by moral and physical weakness, I lay down on the sofa. I forgot to tell them to wake me and only woke at half-past eleven. My aunt was better. I drove home to my wife. She, poor thing, was quite worn out expecting me. I snatched a bite of something, embraced my little boy, reassured my wife, and set off to call on you. You were not at home. At your flat I found Yevgeny Nikolaitch. When I got home I took up a pen, and here I am writing you. Don't grumble and be cross to me, my true friend. Beat me, chop my guilty head off my shoulders, but don't deprive me of your affection. From your wife I learned that you will be at the Slavyanovs this evening. I will certainly be there. I look forward with the greatest impatience to seeing you. I remain, etc. P.S. We are in perfect despair about our little boy. Karl Fyodorich prescribes rhubarb. He moans. Yesterday he did not know anyone. This morning he did know us and began lisping, Papa, Mama. Boo! My wife was in tears the whole morning. 4. From Ivan Petrovich to Pyotr Ivanich My dear sir, Pyotr Ivanich, I am writing to you in your room, at your bureau, and before taking up my pen I have been waiting for more than two and a half hours for you. Now allow me to tell you straight out, Pyotr Ivanich, my frank opinion about this shabby incident. From your last letter I gathered that you were expected at the Slavyanovs, that you were inviting me to go there. I turned up, I stayed for five hours, and there was no sign of you. Why am I to be made a laughingstock to people, do you suppose? Excuse me, my dear sir. I came to you this morning. I hope to find you not imitating certain deceitful persons who look for people, God knows where, when they can be found at home at any suitably chosen time. There is no sign of you at home. I don't know what restrains me from telling you now the whole harsh truth. I will only say that I see you seem to be going back on your bargain regarding our agreement, and only now reflecting on the whole affair— I cannot but confess that I am absolutely astounded at the artful workings of your mind. I see clearly now that you have been cherishing your unfriendly design for a long time. This supposition of mine is confirmed by the fact that last week, in an almost unpardonable way, you took possession of that letter of yours addressed to me, in which you laid down yourself, though rather vaguely and incoherently, 
the terms of our agreement in regard to a circumstance of which I need not remind you. You are afraid of documents, you destroy them, and you try to make a fool of me. But I won't allow myself to be made a fool of, for no one has ever considered me one hitherto, and every one has thought well of me in that respect. I am opening my eyes. You try and put me off, confuse me with talk of Yevgeny Nikolaitch, and when with your letter of the seventh of this month, which I am still at a loss to understand, I seek a personal explanation from you. You make humbugging appointments while you keep out of the way. Surely you do not oppose, sir, that I am not equal to noticing all this. You promise to reward me for my services, of which you are very well aware, in the way of introducing various persons, and at the same time, and I don't know how you do it, you contrive to borrow money from me in considerable sums, without giving a receipt, as happened no longer ago than last week. Now, having got the money, you keep out of the way, and what's more, you repudiate the service I have done you in regard to Yevgeny Nikolaitch. You are probably reckoning on my speedy departure to Simbersk, and hoping I may not have time to settle your business. But I assure you solemnly and testify on my word of honor that if it comes to that, I am prepared to spend two more months in Petersburg, expressly to carry through my business, to attain my objects, and to get hold of you. For I, too, on occasion know how to get the better of people. In conclusion, I beg to inform you that if you do not give me a satisfactory explanation today, first in writing, and then personally face to face, and do not make a fresh statement in your letter of the chief points of the agreement existing between us, and do not explain fully your views in regard to Yevgeny Nikolaitch. I shall be compelled to have recourse to measures that will be highly unpleasant to you, and indeed repugnant to me also. Allow me to remain, etc. 5. From Pyotr Ivanich to Ivan Petrovich. November 11th. My dear and honored friend, Ivan Petrovich, I was cut to the heart by your letter. I wondered you were not ashamed, my dear but unjust friend, to behave like this to one of your most devoted friends. Why be in such a hurry, and, without explaining things fully, wound me with such insulting suspicions? But I hasten to reply to your charges. You did not find me yesterday, Ivan Petrovich, because I was suddenly and quite unexpectedly called away to a deathbed. My aunt, Efimya Nikolaevna, passed away yesterday evening at eleven o'clock in the night. By the general consent of the relatives, I was selected to make the arrangements for the sad and sorrowful ceremony. I had so much to do that that I had not time to see you this morning, nor even to send you a line. I am grieved to the heart at the misunderstanding which has arisen between us. My words about Yevgeny Nikolaitch, uttered casually and in jest, you have taken in quite a wrong sense, and have ascribed to them a meaning deeply offensive to me. You refer to money and express your anxiety about it, but without wasting words I am ready to satisfy all your claims and demands, though I must remind you that the three hundred and fifty roubles I had from you last week were in accordance with a certain agreement, and not by way of a loan. In the latter case there would certainly have been a receipt. I will not condescend to discuss the other points mentioned in your letter. I see that it is a misunderstanding. I see it is your habitual hastiness, hot temper and obstinacy. I know that your good-heartedness and open character will not allow doubts to persist in your heart, and that you will be, in fact, the first to hold out your hand to me. You are mistaken, Ivan Petrovitch. You are greatly mistaken. Although your letter has deeply wounded me, I should be prepared even today to come to you and apologize. But I have been since yesterday in such a rush and flurry that I am utterly exhausted and can scarcely stand on my feet. To complete my troubles, my wife is laid up. I am afraid she is seriously ill. 
Our little boy, thank God, is better. But I must lay down my pen. I have a mass of things to do, and they are urgent. Allow me, my dear friend, to remain, etc. 6. From Ivan Petrovich to Peter Ivanich. November 14th. Dear sir, Peter Ivanich, I have been waiting for three days. I tried to make a profitable use of them. Meanwhile, I feel that politeness and good manners are the greatest of ornaments for everyone. Since my last letter of the tenth of this month, I have neither by word nor deed reminded you of my existence, partly in order to allow you undisturbed to perform the duty of a Christian in regard to your aunt, partly because I needed the time for certain considerations and investigations in regard to a business you know of. Now, I hasten to explain myself to you in the most thoroughgoing and decisive manner. I frankly confess that on reading your first two letters, I seriously suppose that you did not understand what I wanted. That was how it was that I rather sought an interview with you and explanations face to face. I was afraid of writing and blamed myself for lack of clearness in the expression of my thoughts on paper. You are aware that I have not the advantages of education and good manners, and that I shun a hollow show of gentility because I have learned from bitter experience how misleading appearances often are, and that a snake sometimes lies hidden under flowers. But you understood me. You did not answer me as you should have done, because, in the treachery of your heart, you had planned beforehand to be faithless to your word of honor and to the friendly relations existing between us. You have proved this absolutely by your abominable conduct toward me of late, which is fatal to my interests, which I did not expect and which I refuse to believe till the present moment. From the very beginning of our acquaintance you captivated me by your clever manners, by the subtlety of your behavior, your knowledge of affairs, and the advantages to be gained by association with you. I imagined that I had found a true friend and well-wisher. Now I recognize clearly that there are many people who, under a flattering and brilliant exterior, hide venom in their hearts who use their cleverness to weave snares for their neighbor and for unpardonable deception, and so are afraid of pen and paper, and at the same time use their fine language not for the benefit of their neighbor and their country, but to drug and bewitch the reason of those who have entered into business relations of any sort with them. Your treachery to me, my dear sir, can be clearly seen from what follows. In the first place... When, in the clear and distinct terms of my letter, I described my position, sir, and at the same time asked you in my first letter what you meant by certain expressions and intentions of yours, principally in regard to Yevgeny Nikolaitch, you tried for the most part to avoid answering, and confounding me by doubts and suspicions, you calmly put the subject aside. Then, after treating me in a way which cannot be described by any seemly word, you began writing that you were wounded. Pray, what am I to call that, sir? Then, when every minute was precious to me, and when you had set me running after you all over the town, you wrote pretending personal friendship, letters in which, intentionally avoiding all mention of business, you spoke of utterly irrelevant matters— to wit, of the illness of your good lady, for whom I have in any case every respect, and of how your baby had been dosed with rhubarb and was cutting a tooth. All this you alluded to in every letter with a disgusting regularity that was insulting to me. Of course, I am prepared to admit that a father's heart may be torn by the sufferings of his babe. But why make mention of this when something different— far more important and interesting was needed. I endured it in silence, but now when time has elapsed I think it my duty to explain myself. Finally, treacherously deceiving me several times by making humbugging appointments, you tried, it seems, to make me play the part of a fool and a laughingstock for you, which I never intended to be. 
Then, after first inviting me and thoroughly deceiving me, you informed me that you were called away to your suffering aunt who had had a stroke, precisely at five o'clock as you stated with shameful exactitude. Luckily for me, sir, in the course of these three days, I have succeeded in making inquiries and have learnt from them that your aunt had a stroke on the day before the seventh, not long before midnight. From this fact, I see that you have made use of sacred family relations in order to deceive persons in no way concerned with them. Finally, in your last letter, you mentioned the death of your relatives as though it had taken place precisely at the time when I was to have visited you to consult about various business matters. But here, the vileness of your arts and calculations exceeds all belief. For from trustworthy information, which I was able by a lucky chance to obtain just in the nick of time, I have found out that your aunt died twenty-four hours later than the time you so impiously fixed for her decease in your letter. I shall never have done if I enumerate all the signs by which I have discovered your treachery in regard to me. It is sufficient indeed for any impartial observer that in every letter you style me your true friend and call me all sorts of polite names which you do to the best of my belief for no other object than to put my conscience to sleep. I have come now to your principal act of deceit and treachery in regard to me, to wit, your continual silence of late in regard to everything concerning our common interests, in regard to your wicked theft of the letter in which you stated, though in language somewhat obscure and not perfectly intelligible to me, our mutual agreements, your barbarous forcible loan of three hundred and fifty roubles, which you borrowed from me as your partner without giving any receipt. And finally, your abominable slanders of our common acquaintance, Yevgeny Nikolaitch. I see clearly now that you meant to show me that he was, if you will allow me to say so, like a billy goat, good for neither milk nor wool, that he was neither one thing nor the other, neither fish nor flesh, which you put down as a vice in him in your letter of the sixth instant. I knew Yevgeny Nikolaitch as a modest and well-behaved young man, whereby he may well attract, gain, and deserve respect in society. I know also that every evening for the last fortnight you've put into your pocket dozens, and sometimes even hundreds of rubles, playing games of chance with Yevgeny Nikolaitch. Now you disavow all this and not only refuse to compensate me for what I have suffered, but have even appropriated money belonging to me, tempting me by suggestions that I should be partner in the affair, and luring me with various advantages which were to accrue. After having appropriated in a most illegal way money of mine and of Yevgeny Nikolaitch's, you decline to compensate me resorting for that object to calumny with which you have unjustifiably blackened in my eyes a man whom i by my efforts and exertions introduced into your house while on the contrary from what i hear from your friends you are still almost slobbering over him and give out to the whole world that he is your dearest friend though there is no one in the world such a fool as not to guess at once what your designs are aiming at, and what your friendly relations really mean. I should say that they mean deceit, treachery, forgetfulness of human duties and proprieties, contrary to the law of God and vicious in every way. I take myself as a proof and example. In what way have I offended you, and why have you treated me in this godless fashion? I will end my letter... I have explained myself. Now in conclusion, if, sir, you do not in the shortest possible time, after receiving this letter, return me in full, first, the three hundred and fifty roubles I gave you, and secondly, all the sums that should come to me according to your promise, I will have recourse to every possible means to compel you to return it, even to open force.' 
Secondly, to the protection of the laws. And finally, I beg to inform you that I am in possession of facts, which, if they remain in the hands of your humble servant, may ruin and disgrace your name in the eyes of all the world. Allow me to remain, etc. 7. From Pyotr Ivanich to Ivan Petrovich, November 15th. Ivan Petrovich, when I received your vulgar and at the same time queer letter, my impulse for the first minute was to tear it into shreds, but I have preserved it as a curiosity. I do, however, sincerely regret our misunderstandings and unpleasant relations. I did not mean to answer you, but I am compelled by necessity. I must in these lines inform you that it would be very unpleasant for me to see you in my house at any time. My wife feels the same. She is in delicate health, and the smell of tar upsets her. My wife sends your wife the book Don Quixote de la Mancha, with her sincere thanks. As for the galoshes you say you left behind here on your last visit, I must regretfully inform you that they are nowhere to be found. They are still being looked for, but... If they do not turn up, then I will buy you a new pair. I have the honor to remain your sincere friend. 8. On the 16th of November, Pyotr Ivanich received by post two letters addressed to him. Opening the first envelope, he took out a carefully folded note on pale pink paper. The handwriting was his wife's. It was addressed to Yevgeny Nikolaevich and dated November the 2nd. There was nothing else in the envelope. Peter Ivanich read, Dear Eugene, yesterday was utterly impossible. My husband was at home the whole evening. Be sure to come tomorrow punctually at eleven. At half past ten, my husband is going to Tsarsko, and not coming back till evening. I was in a rage all night. Thank you for sending me the information and the correspondence. What a lot of paper! Did she really write all that? She has style, though. Many thanks, dear. I see that you love me. Don't be angry, but for goodness sake, come tomorrow. A. Pyotr Ivanich tore open the other letter. Pyotr Ivanich, I should never have set foot again in your house anyway. You need not have troubled to soil paper about it. Next week I am going to Zimbursk. Yevgeny Nikolaevich remains your precious and beloved friend. I wish you luck, and don't trouble about the galoshes. 9. On the 17th of November, Ivan Petrovich received by post two letters addressed to him. Opening the first letter, he took out a hasty and carelessly written note— the handwriting was his wife's. It was addressed to Yevgeny Nikolaevich and dated August the 4th. There was nothing else in the envelope. Ivan Petrovich read, Goodbye, goodbye, Yevgeny Nikolaevich. The Lord reward you for this too. May you be happy, but my lot is bitter, terribly bitter. It is your choice. If it had not been for my aunt, I should not have put such trust in you. Do not laugh at me, nor at my aunt. Tomorrow is our wedding. Aunt is relieved that a good man has been found, and that he will take me without a dowry. I took a good look at him for the first time today. He seems good-natured. They are hurrying me. Farewell, farewell, my darling. Think of me sometimes. I shall never forget you. Farewell. I sign this last like my first letter. Do you remember? Tatiana. The second letter was as follows. Ivan Petrovich, tomorrow you will receive a new pair of galoshes. It is not my habit to filch from other men's pockets, and I am not fond of picking up all sorts of rubbish in the streets. Yevgeny Nikolaevich is going to Simbirsk in a day or two on his grandfather's business, and he has asked me to find a traveling companion for him. Wouldn't you like to take him with you? The Peasant Mari 
It was the second day in Easter week. The air was warm, the sky was blue, the sun was high, warm, bright. But my soul was very gloomy. I sauntered behind the prison barracks. I stared at the palings of the stout prison fence, counting the movers, but I had no inclination to count them, though it was my habit to do so. This was the second day of the holidays in the prison. The convicts were not taken out to work. There were numbers of men drunk. Loud abuse and quarreling was springing up continually in every corner. There were hideous, disgusting songs and card parties installed beside the platform beds. Several of the convicts who had been sentenced by their comrades for special violence, to be beaten till they were half dead, were lying on the platform bed, covered with sheepskins till they should recover and come to themselves again. Knives had already been drawn several times. For these two days of holiday, all this had been torturing me till it made me ill. And indeed, I could never endure without repulsion the noise and disorder of drunken people, and especially in this place. On these days, even the prison officials did not look into the prison, made no searches, did not look for vodka, understanding that they must allow even these outcasts to enjoy themselves once a year, and that things would be even worse if they did not. At last a sudden fury flamed up in my heart. A political prisoner called Monsieur met me. He looked at me gloomily, his eyes flashed and his lips quivered. Je hais ce brigand. He hissed to me through his teeth and walked on. I returned to the prison ward, though only a quarter of an hour before I had rushed out of it, as though I were crazy, when six stalwart fellows had altogether flung themselves upon the drunken Tatar Gassin to suppress him and had begun beating him. They beat him stupidly. A camel might have been killed by such blows, but they knew that this Hercules was not easy to kill, and so they beat him without uneasiness. Now, on returning, I noticed on the bed in the furthest corner of the room Gazin lying unconscious, almost without sign of life. He lay covered with a sheepskin, and everyone walked around him without speaking, though they confidently hoped that he would come to himself next morning. Yet if luck was against him, maybe from a beating like that, the man would die. I made my way to my own place opposite the window with the iron grating, and lay on my back with my hands behind my head and my eyes shut. I like to lie like that. A sleeping man is not molested, and meanwhile one can dream and think. But I could not dream. My heart was beating uneasily, and Monsieur's words, Je hais ce brigand, were echoing in my ears. But why describe my impressions? I sometimes dream even now of those times at night, and I have no dreams more agonizing. Perhaps it will be noticed that even to this day I have scarcely once spoken in print of my life in prison. The House of the Dead I wrote fifteen years ago in the character of an imaginary person, a criminal who had killed his wife. I may add, by the way, that since then very many persons have supposed, and even now maintain, that I was sent to penal servitude for the murder of my wife. Gradually, I sank into forgetfulness and by degrees was lost in memories. During the whole course of my four years in prison, I was continually recalling all my past and seemed to live over again the whole of my life in recollection. Those memories rose up of themselves. It was not often that of my own will I summoned them. It would begin from some point some little thing, at times unnoticed, and then by degrees there would rise up a complete picture, some vivid and incomplete impression. I used to analyze these impressions, give new features to what had happened long ago, and best of all, I used to correct it, correct it continually. That was my great amusement. On this occasion, I suddenly, for some reason, remembered an unnoticed moment in my early childhood, when I was only nine years old, a moment which I should have thought I had utterly forgotten, but at that time I was particularly fond of memories of my early childhood. I remembered the month of August in our country house, a dry, bright day, but rather cold and windy. Summer was waning, and soon we should have to go to Moscow. 
to be bored all the winter over French lessons, and I was so sorry to leave the country. I walked past the threshing floor, and going down the ravine, I went up to the dense thicket of bushes that covered the further side of the ravine as far as the copse, and I plunged right into the midst of the bushes, and heard a peasant ploughing alone on the clearing about thirty paces away. I knew that he was ploughing up the steep hill, and the horse was moving with effort, and from time to time the peasant's call, "'Come up!' floated upwards to me. I knew almost all our peasants, but I did not know which it was ploughing now, and I did not care who it was. I was absorbed in my own affairs. I was busy, too. I was breaking off switches from the nut-trees to whip the frogs with. Nut-sticks make such fine whips, but they do not last, while birch-twigs are just the opposite. I was interested, too, in beetles and other insects. I used to collect them. Some were very ornamental. I was very fond, too, of the little nimble red and yellow lizards with black spots on them, but I was afraid of snakes. Snakes, however, were much more rare than lizards. There were not many mushrooms there. To get mushrooms one had to go to the birch wood, and I was about to set off there. And there was nothing in the world that I loved so much as the wood with its mushrooms and wild berries, with its beetles and its birds, its hedgehogs and its squirrels, with its damp smell of dead leaves, which I loved so much, and even as I write I smell the fragrance of our birch wood. These impressions will remain for my whole life. Suddenly, in the midst of the profound stillness, I heard a clear and distinct shout. Wolf! I shrieked and beside myself with terror, calling out at the top of my voice, ran out into the clearing and straight into the peasant who was ploughing. It was our peasant, Mari. I don't know if there is such a name, but everyone called him Mari. A thick-set, rather well-grown peasant of fifty, with a good many gray hairs in his dark brown spreading beard. I knew him, but had scarcely ever happened to speak to him till then. He stopped his horse on hearing my cry, and, when breathless, I caught with one hand at his plow and with the other at his sleeve, he saw how frightened I was. "'There is a wolf!' I cried, panting. He flung up his head and could not help looking round for an instant, almost believing me. "'Where is the wolf?' "'A shout! Someone shouted, "'Wolf!' I faltered out. "'Nonsense! Nonsense! A wolf! Why, it was your fancy! How could there be a wolf?' He muttered, reassuring me but I was trembling all over and still kept tight hold of his smock-frock, and I must have been quite pale. He looked at me with an uneasy smile, evidently anxious and troubled over me. "'Why, you have had a fright. Ay, ay. He shook his head. "'There, dear. Come, little one. ay. He stretched out his hand and all at once stroked my cheek. Come, come there. Christ be with you. Cross yourself. But I did not cross myself. The corners of my mouth were twitching, and I think that struck him particularly. He put out his thick, black-nailed, earth-stained finger and softly touched my twitching lips. Ay, there, there, he said to me with a slow, almost motherly smile. Dear, dear. What is the matter? There, come, come. I grasped at last that there was no wolf, and that the shout that I had heard was my fancy. Yet that shout had been so clear and distinct, but such shouts, not only about wolves, I had imagined once or twice before, and I was aware of that. These hallucinations passed away later as I grew older. Well, I will go then. I said, looking at him timidly and inquiringly. "'Well, do, and I'll keep watch on you as you go. I won't let the wolf get at you.' He added, still smiling at me with the same motherly expression. "'Well, Christ be with you. Come, run along, then.' And he made the sign of the cross over me and then over himself. I walked away, looking back, almost at every tenth step. 
Mari stood still with his mare as I walked away, and looked after me and nodded to me every time I looked round. I must own I felt a little ashamed at having let him see me so frightened, but I was still very much afraid of the wolf as I walked away, until I reached the first barn halfway up the slope of the ravine. There my fright vanished completely, and all at once our yard dog, Volchok, flew to meet me. With Volchok I felt quite safe, and I turned round to Mari for the last time. I could not see his face distinctly, but I felt that he was still nodding and smiling affectionately to me. I waved to him. He waved back to me and started his little mare. "'Come up!' I heard his call in the distance again, and the little mare pulled at the plow again. All this I recalled all at once. I don't know why, but with extraordinary minuteness of detail. I suddenly roused myself and sat up on the platform bed, and, I remember, found myself still smiling quietly at my memories. I brooded over them for another minute. When I got home that day I told no one of my adventure with Mari, and indeed it was hardly an adventure. And, in fact, I soon forgot Mari. When I met him now and then afterwards, I never even spoke to him about the wolf or anything else. And all at once now, twenty years afterwards in Siberia, I remembered this meeting with such distinctness to the smallest detail. So it must have lain hidden in my soul, though I knew nothing of it and rose suddenly to my memory when it was wanted. I remembered the soft motherly smile of the poor serf, the way he signed to me with the cross and shook his head. There, there, you have had a fright, little one. And I remembered particularly the thick, earth-stained finger with which he softly and with timid tenderness touched my quivering lips. Of course, any one would have reassured a child, but— Something quite different seemed to have happened in that solitary meeting, and if I had been his own son, he could not have looked at me with eyes shining with greater love. And what made him like that? He was our serf, and I was his little master after all. No one would know that he had been kind to me and reward him for it. Was he, perhaps, very fond of little children? Some people are. It was a solitary meeting in the deserted fields, and only God, perhaps, may have seen from above with what deep and humane civilized feeling, and with what delicate, almost feminine tenderness, the heart of a coarse, brutally ignorant Russian serf, who had as yet no expectation, no idea even of his freedom, may be filled. Was not this, perhaps, what Konstantin Aksakov meant when he spoke of the high degree of culture of our peasantry. And when I got down off the bed and looked around me, I remember I suddenly felt that I could look at these unhappy creatures with quite different eyes, and that suddenly, by some miracle, all hatred and anger had vanished utterly from my heart. I walked about, looking into the faces that I met, the shaven peasant, branded on his face as a criminal, bawling his hoarse drunken song may be that very Mari. I cannot look into his heart. I met Monsieur again that evening. Poor fellow! He could have no memories of Russian peasants and no other view of these people, but je hais ces brigands. Yes, the Polish prisoners had more to bear than I. Section 15 of Short Stories by Fyodor Dostoevsky. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Bobak From Somebody's Diary Semyon Ardelyanovich said to me all of a sudden the day before yesterday, Why, will you ever be sober, Ivan Ivanovich? Tell me that, pray. A strange requirement. I did not resent it. I am a timid man. But here they have actually made me out mad. An artist painted my portrait as it happened. After all, you are a literary man, he said. I submitted. He exhibited it. I read, go and look at that morbid face suggesting insanity. It may be so, but 
think of putting it so bluntly into print. In print everything ought to be decorous. There ought to be ideals, while instead of that... Say it indirectly, at least. That's what you have style for. But no, he doesn't care to do it indirectly. Nowadays humor and a fine style have disappeared, and abuse is accepted as wit. I do not resent it, but God knows I am not enough of a literary man to go out of my mind. I have written a novel. It has not been published. I have written articles. They have been refused. Those articles I took about from one editor to another. Everywhere they refused them. You have no salt, they told me. What sort of salt do you want? I asked with a jeer. Attic salt? They did not even understand. For the most part I translate from the French for the booksellers. I write advertisements for shopkeepers, too. Unique opportunity. Fine tea from our own plantations. I made a nice little sum over a panegyric on His Deceased Excellency Pieter Matvich. I compiled the Art of Pleasing the Ladies, a commission from a bookseller. I have brought out some six little works of this kind in the course of my life. I am thinking of making a collection of the Bon Mot of Voltaire, but am afraid it may seem a little flat to our people. Voltaire's no good now. Nowadays we want a cudgel, not Voltaire. We knock each other's last teeth out nowadays. Well, so that's the whole extent of my literary activity. Though, indeed, I do send round letters to the editors gratis and fully signed. I give them all sorts of counsels and admonitions, criticize and point out the true path. The letter I sent last week to an editor's office was the fortieth I had sent in the last two years. I have wasted four roubles over stamps alone for them. My temper is at the bottom of it all. I believe that the artist who painted me did so not for the sake of literature, but for the sake of two symmetrical warts on my forehead. A natural phenomenon, he would say. They have no ideas, so now they are out for phenomena. And didn't he succeed in getting my warts in his portrait? To the life! That is what they call realism. And as to madness, a great many people were put down as mad among us last year, and in such language, with such original talent. And yet, after all, it appears. However, one ought to have foreseen it long ago. That is rather artful, so that from the point of view of pure art, one may really commend it. Well, but after all, these so-called madmen have turned out cleverer than ever. So it seems the critics can call them mad, but they cannot produce any one better. The wisest of all, in my opinion, is he who can, if only once a month, call himself a fool, a faculty unheard of nowadays. In old days, once a year at any rate, a fool would recognize that he was a fool. But nowadays, not a bit of it and they have so muddled things up that there is no telling a fool from a wise man. They have done that on purpose. I remember a witty Spaniard saying when, 250 years ago, the French built their first madhouses. They have shut up all their fools in a house apart to make sure that they are wise men themselves. Just so. You don't show your own wisdom by shutting someone else in a madhouse. K has gone out of his mind, means that we are sane now. No, it doesn't mean that yet. Hang it, though. Why am I maundering on? I go on grumbling and grumbling. Even my maidservant is sick of me. Yesterday a friend came to see me. Your style is changing, he said. It is choppy. You chop and chop, and then a parenthesis, then a parenthesis in the parenthesis, then you stick in something else in brackets, then you begin chopping and chopping again. The friend is right. Something strange is happening to me. My character is changing, and my head aches. I am beginning to see and hear strange things. Not voices, exactly, but as though someone beside me were muttering, Bobak, Bobak, Bobak. What's the meaning of this Bobak? I must divert my mind. 
I went out in search of diversion. I hit upon a funeral. A distant relation, a collegiate counsellor, however, a widow and five daughters, all marriageable young ladies. What must it come to even to keep them in slippers? Their father managed it, but now there is only a little pension. They will have to eat humble pie. They have always received me ungraciously. And indeed, I should not have gone to the funeral now had it not been for a peculiar circumstance. I followed the procession to the cemetery with the rest. They were stuck up and held aloof from me. My uniform was certainly rather shabby. It's five and twenty years, I believe, since I was at the cemetery. What a wretched place! To begin with, the smell. There were fifteen hearses with palls varying in expensiveness. There were actually two catafalques. One was a general's and one some ladies. There were many mourners, a great deal of feigned mourning, and a great deal of open gaiety. The clergy have nothing to complain of. It brings them a good income. But the smell, the smell. I should not like to be one of the clergy here. I kept glancing at the faces of the dead cautiously, distrusting my impressionability. Some had a mild expression, some looked unpleasant. As a rule, the smiles were disagreeable, and in some cases very much so. I don't like them. They haunt one's dreams. During the service I went out of the church into the air. It was a gray day, but dry. It was cold, too, but then it was October. I walked about among the tombs. They are of different grades. The third grade cost thirty roubles. It's decent and not so very dear. The first two grades are tombs in the church and under the porch. They cost a pretty penny. On this occasion they were burying in tombs of the third grade six persons, among them the general and the lady. I looked into the graves, and it was horrible. Water and such water, absolutely green and— But there, why talk of it? The gravedigger was bailing it out every minute. I went out while the service was going on and strolled outside the gates. Close by was an almshouse, and a little further off there was a restaurant. It was not a bad little restaurant. There was lunch and everything. There were lots of the mourners there. I noticed a great deal of gaiety and genuine heartiness. I had something to eat and drink. Then I took part in the bearing of the coffin from the church to the graveyard. Why is it that corpses in their coffins are so heavy? They say it is due to some sort of inertia, that the body is no longer directed by its owner, or some nonsense of that sort, in opposition to the laws of mechanics and common sense. I don't like to hear people who have nothing but a general education venture to solve the problems that require special knowledge. And with us that's done continually. Civilians love to pass opinions about subjects that are the province of the soldier and even of the field marshal while men who have been educated as engineers prefer discussing philosophy and political economy. I did not go to the requiem service. I have some pride. And if I am only received owing to some special necessity, why force myself on their dinners, even if it be a funeral dinner? The only thing I don't understand is why I stayed at the cemetery. I sat on a tombstone and sank into appropriate reflections. I began with the Moscow exhibition and ended with reflecting upon astonishment in the abstract. My deductions about astonishment were these. To be surprised at everything is stupid, of course, and to be astonished at nothing is a great deal more becoming, and for some reason accepted as good form. But that is not really true. To my mind, to be astonished at nothing is much more stupid than to be astonished at everything. And moreover, to be astonished at nothing is almost the same as feeling respect for nothing. And indeed, a stupid man is incapable of feeling respect. But what I desire most of all is to feel respect. I thirst to feel respect. One of my acquaintances said to me the other day, He thirsts to feel respect. Goodness, I thought. What would happen to you if you dared to print that nowadays? At that point I sank into forgetfulness. I don't like reading the epitaphs of tombstones. 
They are everlastingly the same. An unfinished sandwich was lying on the tombstone near me, stupid and inappropriate. I threw it on the ground, as it was not bread but only a sandwich. Though I believe it is not a sin to throw bread on the earth, but only on the floor. I must look it up in Souverin's calendar. I suppose I sat there for a long time. Too long a time, in fact. I must have lain down on a long stone, which was of the shape of a marble coffin. And how it happened, I don't know. But I began to hear things of all sorts being said. At first I did not pay attention to it, but treated it with contempt. But the conversation went on. I heard muffled sounds as though the speaker's mouths were covered with a pillow, and at the same time they were distinct and very near. I came to myself, sat up, and began listening attentively. "'Your Excellency, it's utterly impossible. You led hearts. I return your lead, and here you play the seven of diamonds. You ought to have given me a hint about diamonds.' "'What? Play by hard and fast rules? Where is the charm of that?' "'You must, Your Excellency. One can't do anything without something to go upon. We must play with dummy. Let one hand not be turned up.' "'Well, you won't find a dummy here.' What conceited words! And it was queer and unexpected. One was such a ponderous, dignified voice. The other softly suave. I should not have believed it if I had not heard it myself. I had not been to the requiem dinner, I believe. And yet, how could they be playing preference here, and what general was this? That the sounds came from under the tombstones of that, there could be no doubt. I bent down and read on the tomb, Here lies the body of Major General Pervoyedev, a cavalier of such and such orders. Hmm. Passed away in August of this year, fifty-seven. Rest, beloved ashes, till the joyful dawn. Hm, dash it, it really is a general. There was no monument on the grave from which the obsequious voice came. There was only a tombstone. He must have been a fresh arrival. From his voice he was a lower court counsellor. <laughs> I heard a new voice a dozen yards from the general's resting place, coming from quite a fresh grave. The voice belonged to a man and a plebeian, mawkish with its affectation of religious fervor. <laughs> oh, here he is hiccuping again, cried the haughty and disdainful voice of an irritated lady, apparently of the highest society. It is an affliction to be by this shopkeeper. I didn't hiccup, why, I've had nothing to eat. It's simply my nature. Really, madam, you don't seem to be able to get rid of your caprices here. Then why don't you come and lie down here? They put me here. My wife and little children put me here. I did not lie down here of myself. The mystery of death. And I would not have lain down beside you, not for any money. I lay here as befitting my fortune, judging by the price. For we can always do that. Pay for a tomb of the third grade. You made money, I suppose. You fleeced people. Fleece you, indeed. We haven't seen the color of your money since January. There's a little bill against you at the shop. Well, that's really stupid. To try and recover debts here is too stupid, to my thinking. Go to the surface. Ask my niece. She is my heiress. There's no asking anyone now, and no going anywhere. We have both reached our limit, and before the judgment seat of God are equal in our sins. In our sins? The lady mimicked him contemptuously. Don't dare to speak to me. <laughs> you see, the shopkeeper obeys the lady, Your Excellency. Why shouldn't he? Why, Your Excellency, because we all know things are different here. Different? How? We are dead, so to speak, Your Excellency. Oh, yes, but still. Well, this is an entertainment. It is a fine show, I must say. If it has come to this down here, what can one expect on the surface? But what a queer business. 
I went on listening, however, though with extreme indignation. Yes, I should like a taste of life. Yes, you know, I should like a taste of life. I heard a new voice suddenly somewhere in the space between the general and the irritable lady. Do you hear, your excellency? Our friend is at the same game again. For three days at a time he says nothing, and then he bursts out with, I should like a taste of life. Yes, a taste of life. And with such an appetite. Hee <laughs> hee. And such frivolity. It gets hold of him, your excellency. And do you know, he is growing sleepy quite sleepy. He has been here since April, and then all of the sudden, I should like a taste of life. It is rather dull, though, observed His Excellency. It is, Your Excellency. Shall we tease Avdolcha Ignatyevna again? He <laughs> No, spare me, please. I can't endure that quarrelsome virago. And I can't endure either of you cried the virago disdainfully. You are both of you bores and can't tell me anything ideal. I know one little story about you, your excellency. Don't turn your nose up, please. How a manservant swept you out from under a married couple's bed one morning. Nasty woman. The general muttered through his teeth. Of Dolce Ignatyevna, ma'am, the shopkeeper wailed suddenly again. My dear lady, don't be angry, but tell me, am I going through the ordeal by torment now, or is it something else? Ah, he is at it again, as I expected, for there's a smell from him which means he is turning round. I am not turning round, madame, and there's no particular smell from me, for I've kept my body whole as it should be, while you're regularly high. For the smell is really horrible, even for a place like this. I don't speak of it merely from politeness. Ha! Huh, you horrid, insulting wretch! He positively stinks and talks about me! <coughs> if only the time for my requiem would come quickly, I should hear their tearful voices over my head, my wife's lament, and my children's soft weeping. Well, that's a thing to fret for. They'll stuff themselves with funeral rice and go home. Oh, I wish somebody would wake up. Avdolcha Ignatyevna, said the insinuating government clerk. Wait a bit. The new arrivals will speak. And are there any young people among them? Yes, there are, Avdolcha Ignatyevna. There are some not more than lads. Oh, how welcome that would be. Haven't they begun yet? inquired His Excellency. Even those who came the day before yesterday haven't awakened yet, Your Excellency. As you know, they sometimes don't speak for a week. It's a good job that today and yesterday and the day before they brought a whole lot. As it is, they are all last year's for seventy feet round. Yes, it will be interesting. Yes, Your Excellency, they buried Tarasevich, the privy councillor, today. I knew it from the voices. I know his nephew. He helped to lower the coffin just now. Hmm. Where is he, then? Five steps from you, Your Excellency, on the left, almost at your feet. You should make his acquaintance, Your Excellency. Hmm. No, it's not for me to make advances. Oh, he will begin of himself, Your Excellency. He will be flattered. Leave it to me, Your Excellency, and I... Oh, oh, what is happening to me? Croaked the frightened voice of a new arrival. A new arrival, Your Excellency, a new arrival. Thank God. And how quick he's been. Sometimes they don't say a word for a week. Oh, I believe it's a young man. Avdotya Ignatyevna cried shrilly. I, I, it was a complication, and so sudden, faltered the young man again. Only the evening before, Schultz said to me, there's a complication, and I died suddenly before morning. Oh, oh. Well, there's no help for it, young man. 
the general observed graciously, evidently pleased at a new arrival. "'You must be comforted. You are kindly welcome to our vale of Jehoshaphat, so to call it. We are kind-hearted people. You will come to know us and appreciate us. Major General Vasily Vasilich Pervoyedev, at your service.' "'Oh, no, no, certainly not. I was at Schultz's. I had a complication, you know. At first it was my chest and a cough, and then I caught a cold, my lungs and influenza, and all of a sudden, quite unexpectedly, the worst of all was its being so unexpected. You say it began with the chest. The government clerk put in suavely, as though he wished to reassure the new arrival. Yes, my chest and guitar, and then no guitar, but still the chest, and I couldn't breathe. And you know? I know, I know. But if it was the chest, you ought to have gone to Ecke and not to Schultz. You know, I kept meaning to go to Botkin's. And all at once... Botkin is quite prohibitive. Observed the general. Oh, no, he is not forbidding at all. I've heard he is so attentive and foretells everything beforehand. His Excellency was referring to his fees. The government clerk corrected him. Oh, not at all. He only has three roubles, and he makes such an examination and gives you a prescription. And I was very anxious to see him, for I have been told... Well, gentlemen, had I better go to Eka or to Botkin? What? To whom? <laughs> the general's corpse shook with agreeable laughter... The government clerk echoed it in falsetto. Dear boy, dear delightful boy, how I love you! Avdotya Ignatyevna squealed ecstatically. I wish they had put someone like you next to me. No, that was too much, and these were the dead of our times. Still, I ought to listen more and not be in too great a hurry to draw conclusions. That sniveling new arrival, I remember him just now in his coffin— had the expression of a frightened chicken, the most revolting expression in the world. However, let us wait and see. But what happened next was such a bedlam that I could not keep it all in my memory, for a great many woke up at once. An official, a civil councillor, woke up, and began discussing at once the project of a new subcommittee in the government department, and of the probable transfer of various functionaries in connection with the subcommittee, which very greatly interested the general. I must confess I learned a great deal that was new myself, so much so that I marveled at the channels by which one may, sometimes, in the metropolis learn government news. Then an engineer half woke up, but for a long time muttered absolute nonsense, so that our friends left off worrying him and let him lie till he was ready. At last, the distinguished lady who had been buried in the morning under the catafalque showed symptoms of the reanimation of the tomb. Le Bessietnikov, for the obsequious lower court counsellor whom I detested and who lay beside General Pervoyedev was called, it appears, Le Bessietnikov, became much excited and surprised that they were all waking up so soon this time. I must own I was surprised too though some of those who had woke had been buried for three days, as, for instance, a very young girl of sixteen who kept giggling, giggling in a horrible and predatory way. "'Your Excellency, Privy Councillor Tarasevich is waking!' Lebeziatnikov announced with extreme fussiness. "'Hey, what?' The Privy Councillor, waking up suddenly, mumbled with a lisp of disgust, there was a note of ill-humoured peremptoriness in the sound of his voice. I listened with curiosity, for during the last few days I had heard something about Tarasevich, shocking and upsetting, in the extreme. "'It's I, Your Excellency, so far only I.' "'What is your petition? What do you want?' "'Merely to inquire after Your Excellency's health.' In these unaccustomed surroundings, everyone feels at first, as it were, oppressed. General Pervoyedev wishes to have the honor of making your excellency's acquaintance, and hopes... 
I've never heard of him. Surely, Your Excellency, General Pervoyedev Vasily Vasilich. Are you General Pervoyedov? No, Your Excellency, I am only the lower court counselor, Lebeziatnikov, at your service, but General Pervoyedev... Nonsense. And I beg you to leave me alone. Let him be. General Pervoyedev at last himself checked with dignity the disgusting officiousness of his sycophant in the grave. He is not fully awake, Your Excellency. You must consider that. It's the novelty of it all. When he is fully awake, he will take it differently. Let him be, repeated the general. That silly vassalage! Hey, Your Excellency! A perfectly new voice shouted loudly and aggressively from close beside Avdotya Ignatyevna. It was a voice of gentlemanly insolence, with the languid pronunciation now fashionable and an arrogant drawl. I've been watching you all for the last two hours. Do you remember me, Vasily Vasilich? My name is Klinovitz. We met at the Volonkonskys, where you, too, were received as a guest. I am sure I don't know why. What, Count Peter Petrovitch? Can it be really you? And at such an early age? How sorry I am to hear it. Oh, I am sorry myself, though I don't really mind, and I want to amuse myself as far as I can everywhere. And I am not a count, but a baron, only a baron. We are only a set of scurvy barons, risen from being flunkies. But why, I don't know, and I don't care. I am only a scoundrel of the pseudo-aristocratic society, and I am regarded as a charming polisson. My father is a wretched little general, and my mother was at one time received en hot lieu. With the help of the Jew, Ziffel, I forged fifty thousand ruble notes last year, and then I informed against him, while Julie Charpentier de Lusignan carried off the money to Bordeaux. And only fancy, I was engaged to be married to a girl still at school, three months under sixteen, with a dowry of ninety thousand... Avdotya Ignatyevna, do you remember how you seduced me fifteen years ago, when I was a boy of fourteen in the Cour de Page? Ha! Huh, that's you, you rascal. Well, you are a godsend anyway, for here... You were mistaken in suspecting your neighbor, the business gentleman of unpleasant fragrance. I said nothing, but I laughed. The stench came from me. They had to bury me in a nailed-up coffin. Oh, you horrid creature. Still, I am glad you are here. You can't imagine the lack of life and wit here. Quite so, quite so. And I intend to start here something original. Your Excellency, I don't mean you, Pervoyedev. Your Excellency, the other one, Tarasevich, the privy councillor. Answer, I am Klinovich, who took you to Mademoiselle Fury in Lent. Do you hear? I do, Klinovich, and I am delighted, and trust me. I wouldn't trust you with a halfpenny, and I don't care. I simply want to kiss you, dear old man, but luckily I can't. Do you know, gentlemen, what this grand pair's little game was? He died three or four days ago, and would you believe it? He left a deficit of 400,000 government money from the Fund for Widows and Orphans. He was the sole person in control of it for some reason, so that his accounts were not audited for the last eight years. I can fancy what long faces they all have now and what they call him. It's a delectable thought, isn't it? I have been wondering for the last year how a wretched old man of seventy, gouty and rheumatic, succeeded in preserving the physical energy for his debaucheries. And now the riddle is solved. Those widows and orphans, the very thought of them must have egged him on. I knew about it long ago, 
I was the only one who did know. It was Julie told me, and as soon as I discovered it, I attacked him in a friendly way at once in Easter week. Give me twenty-five thousand. If you don't, they'll look into your accounts tomorrow. And just fancy, he had only thirteen thousand left then, so it seems it was very apropos his dying now. Grand pair, grand pair, do you hear? Cher Klinovich, I quite agree with you, and there was no need for you to go into such details. Life is so full of suffering and torment and so little to make up for it that I wanted at last to be at rest, and so far as I can see, I hope to get all I can from here, too. I bet that he has already sniffed Katich Berestov. Who? What Katish? There was a rapacious quiver in the old man's voice. Aha! What Katish? Why, here on the left, five paces from me and ten from you. She has been here five days, and if only you knew, Grandpere, what a little wretch she is. Of good family and breeding, and a monster, a regular monster. I did not introduce her to anyone there. I was the only one who knew her. Katich, answer. <laughs> the girl responded with a jangling laugh, in which there was a note of something as sharp as the prick of a needle. <laughs> and a little blonde. The grand pair faltered. Drawing out the syllables, he, <laughs> I have long, I have long. The old man faltered breathlessly. Cherish the dream of a little fair thing of fifteen, and just in such surroundings. Ha! <laughs> the monster! Cried of Dolcha Ignatyevna. Enough. Klinovich decided. I see there is excellent material. We shall soon arrange things better. The great thing is to spend the rest of our time cheerfully. But what time? Hey, you, government clerk, Lebeziatnikov, or whatever it is, I hear that your name. Semyon Yevseyich Lebeziatnikov, lower court counselor at your service. Very, very, very much delighted to meet you. I don't care whether you are delighted or not, but you seem to know everything here. Tell me first of all, how is it we can talk? I've been wondering ever since yesterday. We are dead, and yet we are talking and seem to be moving, and yet we are not talking and not moving. What jugglery is this? If you want an explanation, Baron, Platon Nikolaevich could give you one better than I. What? Platon Nikolaevich is that. To the point, don't beat about the bush. Platon Nikolaevich is our homegrown philosopher, scientist, and master of arts. He has brought out several philosophical works, but for the last three months he has been getting quite drowsy, and there is no stirring him up now. Once a week he mutters something utterly irrelevant. To the point, to the point. He explains all this by the simplest fact, namely that when we were living on the surface, we mistakenly thought that death, there was death. The body revives, as it were. Here, the remains of life are concentrated, but only in consciousness. I don't know how to express it, but life goes on, as it were, by inertia. In his opinion, everything is concentrated somewhere in consciousness and goes on for two or three months. Sometimes even for half a year. There is one here, for instance, who is almost completely decomposed, but once every six weeks he suddenly utters one word, quite senseless, of course, about some bobok. Bobok, bobok. But you see that an imperceptible speck of life is still warm within him. It's rather stupid. Well, and how is it I have no sense of smell, and yet I feel there is a stench? That? <laughs> well, on that point our philosopher is a bit foggy. 
It's apropos of smell, he said, that the stench one perceives here is, so to speak, moral. <laughs> it's the stench of the soul, he says, that in these two or three months it may have time to recover itself. And this is, so to speak, the last mercy. Only I think, Baron, that these are mystic ravings, very excusable in his position. Enough. All the rest of it, I am sure, is nonsense. The great thing is that we have two or three months more of life, and then... Bobak, I propose to spend these two months as agreeably as possible, and so to arrange everything on a new basis. Gentlemen, I propose to cast aside all shame. Ah, let us cast aside all shame. Let us. Many voices could be heard saying, and, strange to say, several new voices were audible, which must have belonged to others newly awakened. The engineer, now fully awake, boomed out his agreement with peculiar delight. The girl, Katish, giggled gleefully. Oh, how I long to cast off all shame. Avdotya Ignatyevna exclaimed rapturously. I say, if Avdotya Ignatyevna wants to cast off all shame. No, 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 Klinovich. I was ashamed up there all the same, but here I should like to cast off shame. I should like it awfully. I understand, Klinovich, boomed the engineer, that you want to rearrange life here on new and rational principles. Oh, I don't care a hang about that. For that, we'll wait for Kudyarov, who was brought here yesterday. When he wakes, he'll tell you all about it. He is such a personality, such a titanic personality. Tomorrow they'll bring along another natural scientist, I believe, an officer for certain, and three or four days later a journalist, and I believe his editor with him. But deuce take them all. There will be a little group of us anyway, and things will arrange themselves. Though, meanwhile, I don't want us to be telling lies. That's all I care about, for that is one thing that matters. One cannot exist on the surface without lying, for life and lying are synonymous. But here we will amuse ourselves by not lying. Hang it all. The grave has some value after all. We'll all tell our stories aloud, and we won't be ashamed of anything. First of all, I'll tell you about myself. I am one of the predatory kind, you know. All that was bound and held in check by rotten cords up there on the surface. Away with cords, and let us spend these two months in shameless truthfulness. Let us strip and be naked. Let us be naked. Let us be naked, cried all the voices. I long to be naked. I long to be... Avdotya Ignatyevna shrilled. Ah, ah, I see we shall have fun here. I don't want Eka after all. No, I tell you, give me a taste of life. He <laughs> giggled Katish. The great thing is that no one can interfere with us, and though I see Pervoyadev is in a temper, he can't reach me with his hand. Grand pair, do you agree? I fully agree, fully, and with the utmost satisfaction, but on condition that Katish is the first to give us her biography. I protest. I protest with all my heart. General Pervoyadov brought out firmly. Your Excellency. The scoundrel Abezietnikov persuaded him in a murmur of fussy excitement. Your Excellency, it will be to our advantage to agree. Here, you see, there's this girl's and all their little affairs. There's the girl, it's true. But... It's to our advantage, Your Excellency, upon my word it is. If only as an experiment, let us try. Even in the grave they won't let us rest in peace. In the first place, General, you were playing preference in the grave, and in the second we don't care a hang about you. Drawed Klinovich. Sir, I beg you not to forget yourself. What? 
Why, you can't get at me, and I can tease you from here as though you were Julie's lapdog. And another thing, gentlemen, how is he a general here? He was a general there, but here is mere refuse. No, not mere refuse, even here. Here you will rot in the grave, and six brass buttons will be all that will be left of you. Bravo! Klinovich! Ha 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 ha! Roared voices. I have served my sovereign. I have the sword. Your sword is only fit to prick mice, and you never drew it even for that. That makes no difference. I formed a part of the whole. There are all sorts of parts in a whole. Bravo, Klinovich! Bravo! Ha ha ha! I don't understand what the sword stands for, boomed the engineer. We shall run away from the Prussians like mice. They'll crush us to powder, cried a voice in the distance that was unfamiliar to me, that was positively spluttering with glee. The sword, sir, is an honor, the general cried, but only I heard him. There arose a prolonged and furious roar, clamor and hubbub, and only the hysterically impatient squeals of Evdolcha Ignatyevna were audible. But do let us make haste. Ha! Ah, when are we going to begin to cast off all shame? <laughs> the soul does in truth pass through torments, exclaimed the voice of the plebeian. And... And here I suddenly sneezed. It happened suddenly and unintentionally, but the effect was striking. All became as silent as one expects it to be in a churchyard. It all vanished like a dream. A real silence of the tomb set in. I don't believe they were ashamed on account of my presence. They had made up their minds to cast off all shame. I waited five minutes. Not a word. Not a sound. It cannot be supposed that they were afraid of my informing the police, for what could the police do to them? I must conclude that they had some secret unknown to the living, which they carefully concealed from every mortal. Well, my dears, I thought, I shall visit you again. And with those words I left the cemetery. No, that I cannot admit. No, I really cannot. The Bobok case does not trouble me, so that is what that Bobok signified. Depravity in such a place, depravity of the last aspirations, depravity of sodden and rotten corpses, and not even sparing the last moments of consciousness. Those moments have been granted, vouchsafed to them, and, and uh, worst of all, in such a place. No. That I cannot admit. I shall go to other tombs. I shall listen everywhere. Certainly one ought to listen everywhere, and not merely at one spot, in order to form an idea. Perhaps one may come across something reassuring. But I shall certainly go back to those. They promise their biographies and anecdotes of all sorts. Tfew! But I shall go. I shall certainly go. It is a question of conscience." I shall take it to the citizen. The editor there has had his portrait exhibited too. Maybe he will print it. The Dream of a Ridiculous Man 1. I am a ridiculous person. Now they call me a madman. That would be a promotion if it were not that I remain as ridiculous in their eyes as before. But now I do not resent it. They are all dear to me now even when they laugh at me, and, indeed, it is just then that they are particularly dear to me. I could join in their laughter, not exactly at myself, but through affection for them, if I did not feel so sad as I look at them. Sad because they do not know the truth, and I do know it. Oh, how hard it is to be the only one who knows the truth! But they won't understand that. No. Uh, they won't understand it. In the old days I used to be miserable at seeming ridiculous. Not seeming, but being. 
I have always been ridiculous, and I have known it, perhaps, from the hour I was born. Perhaps from the time I was seven years old, I knew I was ridiculous. Afterwards I went to school, studied at the university, and, do you know, the more I learned, the more thoroughly I understood that I was ridiculous, so that it seemed in the end as though all the sciences I studied at the university existed only to prove and make evident to me, as I went more deeply into them, that I was ridiculous. It was the same with life as it was with science. With every year the same consciousness of the ridiculous figure I cut in every relation grew and strengthened. Everyone always laughed at me, but not one of them knew or guessed that if there were one man on earth who knew better than anybody else that I was absurd, it was myself. And... What I resented most of all was that they did not know that. But that was my own fault. I was so proud that nothing would have ever induced me to tell it to anyone. This pride grew in me with the years, and if it had happened that I allowed myself to confess to anyone that I was ridiculous, I believe that I should have blown out my brains the same evening. Oh, how I suffered in my early youth from the fear that I might give way and confess it to my schoolfellows. But since I grew to manhood, I have for some unknown reason become calmer, though I realized my awful characteristic more fully every year. I say, unknown, for to this day I cannot tell why it was. Perhaps it was owing to the terrible misery that was growing in my soul, through something which was of more consequence than anything else about me. That something was the conviction that had come upon me that nothing in the world mattered. I had long had an inkling of it, but the full realization came last year almost suddenly. I suddenly felt that it was all the same to me whether the world existed or whether there had never been anything at all. I began to feel with all my being that there was nothing existing. At first I fancied that many things had existed in the past, but afterwards I guessed that there never had been anything in the past either, but that it had only seemed so for some reason. Little by little I guessed that there would be nothing in the future either. Then I left off being angry with people, and almost ceased to notice them. Indeed, this showed itself even in the pettiest trifles. I used, for instance, to knock against people in the street, and not so much from being lost in thought. What had I to think about? I had almost given up thinking by that time. Nothing mattered to me. If at least I had solved my problems. Oh, I had not settled one of them, and how many there were. But I gave up caring about anything, and all the problems disappeared. And it was after that that I found the truth. I learnt the truth last November, on the 3rd of November to be precise, and I remember every instant since. It was a gloomy evening, one of the gloomiest possible evenings. I was going home at about eleven o'clock, and I remember that I thought that the evening could not be gloomier, even physically. Rain had been falling all day, and it had been a cold, gloomy, almost menacing rain, with, I remember, an unmistakable spite against mankind. Suddenly, between ten and eleven, it had stopped, and was followed by a horrible dampness, colder and damper than the rain, and a sort of steam was rising from everywhere, from every stone in the street, and from every by-lane, if one looked down it as far as one could. A thought suddenly occurred to me that if all the street lamps had been put out, it would have been less cheerless, that the gas made one's heart sadder because it lighted it all up. I had had scarcely any dinner that day, and had been spending the evening with an engineer and two other friends had been there also. I sat silent. I fancy I bored them. They talked of something rousing, and suddenly they got excited over it. But they did not really care, I could see that and only made a show of being excited. I suddenly said as much to them. My friends, I said, you really do not care one way or the other. They were not offended, but they all laughed at me. 
That was because I spoke without any note of reproach, simply because it did not matter to me. They saw it did not, and it amused them. As I was thinking about the gas lamps in the street, I looked up at the sky. The sky was horribly dark, but one could distinctly see tattered clouds, and between them fathomless black patches. Suddenly I noticed in one of these patches a star, and began watching it intently. That was because that star gave me an idea. I decided to kill myself that night. I had firmly determined to do so two months before, and poor as I was, I bought a splendid revolver that very day and loaded it. But two months had passed, and it was still lying in my drawer. I was so utterly indifferent that I wanted to seize a moment when I would not be so indifferent. Why, I don't know. And so for two months every night that I came home I thought I would shoot myself. I kept waiting for the right moment. And so now this star gave me a thought. I made up my mind that it should certainly be that night. And why the star gave me the thought, I don't know. And just as I was looking at the sky, this little girl took me by the elbow. The street was empty, and there was scarcely anyone to be seen. A cabman was sleeping in the distance in his cab. It was a child of eight with a kerchief on her head, wearing nothing but a wretched little dress all soaked with rain. But I noticed particularly her wet, broken shoes, and I recall them now. They caught my eye particularly. She suddenly pulled me by the elbow and called me. She was not weeping, but was spasmodically crying out some words which she could not utter properly, because she was shivering and shuddering all over. She was in terror about something and kept crying, Mammy, Mammy. I turned facing her. I did not say a word and went on. But she ran, pulling at me, and there was that note in her voice which in frightened children means despair. I know that sound. Though she did not articulate the words, I understood that her mother was dying, or that something of the sort was happening to them, and that she had run out to call someone, to find something to help her mother. I did not go with her. On the contrary, I had an impulse to drive her away. I told her first to go to a policeman, but clasping her hands she ran beside me sobbing and gasping and would not leave me. Then I stamped my foot and shouted at her. She called out, Sir, sir, but suddenly abandoned me and rushed headlong across the road. Some other passerby appeared there, and she evidently flew from me to him. I mounted up to my fifth story. I have a room in a flat where there are other lodgers. My room is small and poor, with a garret window in the shape of a semicircle. I have a sofa covered with American leather, a table with books on it, two chairs, and a comfortable armchair, as old as can be, but of the good old-fashioned shape. I sat down, lighted the candle, and began thinking. In the room next to mine, through the partition wall, a perfect bedlam was going on. It had been going on for the last three days. A retired captain lived there, and he had half a dozen visitors, gentlemen of doubtful reputation, drinking vodka and playing stoss with old cards. The night before there had been a fight, and I know that two of them had been for a long time engaged in dragging each other about by the hair. The landlady wanted to complain, but she was in abject terror of the captain. There was only one other lodger in the flat. A thin little regimental lady, on a visit to Petersburg, with three little children who had been taken ill since they came into the lodgings. Both she and her children were in mortal fear of the captain, and lay trembling and crossing themselves all night, and the youngest child had a sort of fit from fright. That captain, I know for a fact, sometimes stops people in the Nevsky prospect and begs. They won't take him into the service. But strange to say, that's why I'm telling this, all this month that the captain has been here his behavior has caused me no annoyance. I have, of course, tried to avoid his acquaintance from the very beginning, and he too was bored with me from the first. But I never care how much they shout the other side of the partition, nor how many of them there are in there. I sit up all night and forget them so completely that I do not even hear them. I stay awake till daybreak, and have been going on like that for the last year. I sit up all night in my armchair at the table, doing nothing. I only read by day. I sit, 
Don't even think. Ideas of a sort wander through my mind, and I let them come and go as they will. A whole candle is burnt every night. I sat down quietly at the table, took out the revolver, and put it down before me. When I had put it down, I asked myself, I remember, Is that so? And answered with complete conviction, It is. That is, I shall shoot myself. I knew that I should shoot myself that night for certain, but how much longer I should go on sitting at the table, I did not know. And no doubt I should have shot myself if it had not been for that little girl. 2. You see, though nothing mattered to me, I could feel pain, for instance. If anyone had struck me, it would have hurt me. It was the same morally. If anything very pathetic happened, I should have felt pity just as I used to do in old days when there were things in life that did matter to me. I had felt pity that evening. I should have certainly helped a child. Why, then, had I not helped the little girl? Because of an idea that occurred to me at the time. When she was calling and pulling at me, a question suddenly arose before me, and I could not settle it. The question was an idle one, but I was vexed. I was vexed at the reflection that if I were going to make an end of myself that night, nothing in life ought to have mattered to me. Why was it that all at once I did not feel that nothing mattered, and was sorry for the little girl? I remember that I was very sorry for her, so much so that I felt a strange pang, quite incongruous in my position. Really, I do not know better how to convey my fleeting sensation at the moment, but the sensation persisted at home when I was sitting at the table, and I was very much irritated as I had not been for a long time past. One reflection followed another. I saw clearly that so long as I was still a human being and not nothingness, I was alive, and so could suffer, be angry, and feel shame at my actions. So be it. But if I am going to kill myself in two hours, say, what is the little girl to me, and what have I to do with shame or with anything else in the world? I shall turn into nothing, absolutely nothing. And can it really be true that the consciousness that I shall completely cease to exist immediately, and so everything else will cease to exist, does not in the least affect my feeling of pity for the child, nor the feeling of shame after a contemptible action? I stamped and shouted at the unhappy child, as though to say, not only I feel no pity, but even if I behave inhumanely and contemptibly, I am free to, for in another two hours everything will be extinguished. Do you believe that that was why I shouted that? I am almost convinced of it now. It seemed clear to me that life and the world somehow depended upon me now. I may almost say that the world now seemed created for me alone. If I shot myself, the world would cease to be at least for me. I say nothing of its being likely that nothing will exist for anyone when I am gone, and that as soon as my consciousness is extinguished, the whole world will vanish too, and become void like a phantom as a mere appurtenance of my consciousness, for possibly all this world and all these people are only me, myself. I remember that, as I sat and reflected, I turned all these new questions that swarmed one after another quite the other way, and thought of something quite new. For instance, a strange reflection suddenly occurred to me that if I had lived before on the moon or on Mars, and there had committed the most disgraceful and dishonorable action, and had there been put to such shame and ignominy as one can only conceive and realize in dreams, in nightmares, and if, finding myself afterwards on Earth, I were able to retain the memory of what I had done on the other planet, and at the same time knew that I should never, under any circumstances, return there, then, looking from the earth to the moon, should I care or not? Should I feel shame for that action or not? 
These were idle and superfluous questions, for the revolver was already lying before me, and I knew in every fiber of my being that it would happen for certain. But they excited me, and I raged. I could not die now without having first settled something. In short, the child had saved me, for I put off my pistol shot for the sake of these questions. Meanwhile, the clamor had begun to subside in the captain's room. They had finished their game, were settling down to sleep, and meanwhile were grumbling and languidly winding up their quarrels. At that point I suddenly fell asleep in my chair at the table, a thing which had never happened to me before. I dropped asleep, quite unawares. Dreams, as we all know, are very queer things. Some parts are presented with appalling vividness, with details worked up with the elaborate finish of jewelry, while others one gallops through, as it were, without noticing them at all. As, for instance, through space and time. Dreams seem to be spurred on not by reason, but by desire. Not by the head, but by the heart. And yet what complicated tricks my reason has played sometimes in dreams! What utterly incomprehensible things happen to it! My brother died five years ago, for instance. I sometimes dream of him. He takes part in my affairs. We are very much interested. And yet all through my dream I quite know and remember that my brother is dead and buried. How is it that I am not surprised that, though he is dead, he is here beside me and working with me? Why, it is that my reason fully accepts it? But enough. I will begin about my dream. Yes, I dreamed a dream, my dream of the 3rd of November. They tease me now, telling me it was only a dream. But does it matter whether it was a dream or reality, if the dream made known to me the truth? If once one has recognized the truth and seen it, you know that it is the truth, and that there is no other, and there cannot be. Whether you are asleep or awake, let it be a dream, so be it. But the real life of which you make so much I had meant to extinguish by suicide. And my dream, my dream, oh, it revealed to me a different life, renewed, grand, and full of power. Listen. Three. I have mentioned that I dropped asleep unawares and even seemed to be still reflecting on the same subjects. I suddenly dreamt that I picked up the revolver and aimed it straight at my heart. My heart and not my head, and I had determined beforehand to fire at my head, at my right temple. After aiming at my chest, I waited a second or two, and suddenly my candle, my table, and the wall in front of me began moving and heaving. I made haste to pull the trigger. In dreams you sometimes fall from a height, or are stabbed, or beaten, but you never feel pain unless perhaps you really bruised yourself against the bedstead. Then you feel pain and almost always wake up from it. It was the same in my dream. I did not feel any pain, but it seemed as though, with my shot, everything within me was shaken, and everything was suddenly dimmed and it grew horribly black around me. I seemed to be blinded and benumbed, and I was lying on something hard, stretched on my back. I saw nothing and could not make the slightest movement. People were walking and shouting around me. The captain bawled. The landlady shrieked. And suddenly another break and I was being carried in a closed coffin. And I felt how the coffin was shaking and reflected upon it, and for the first time the idea struck me that I was dead, utterly dead. I knew it, and had no doubt of it. I could neither see nor move, and yet I was feeling and reflecting. But I was soon reconciled to the position, and, as one usually does in a dream, accepted the facts without disputing them. And now... I was buried in the earth. They all went away. 
I was left alone. Utterly alone. I did not move. Whenever before I had imagined being buried, the one sensation I associated with the grave was that of damp and cold. So now I felt that I was very cold, especially the tips of my toes, but I felt nothing else. I lay still. Strange to say, I expected nothing, excepting without dispute that a dead man had nothing to expect. But it was damp. I don't know how long a time passed, whether an hour or several days or many days, but all at once a drop of water fell on my closed left eye, making its way through a coffin lid. It was followed a minute later by a second, then a minute later by a third, and so on regularly every minute. There was a sudden glow of profound indignation in my heart, and I suddenly felt in it a pang of physical pain. That's my wound, I thought. That's the bullet. And drop after drop, every minute kept falling on my closed eyelid. And all at once, not with my voice, but with my whole being, I called upon the power that was responsible for all that was happening to me. Whoever you may be, if you exist, and if anything more rational than what is happening here is possible, suffer it to be here now. But if you are revenging yourself upon me for my senseless suicide, by the hideousness and absurdity of this subsequent existence, then let me tell you that no torture could ever equal the contempt which I shall go on dumbly feeling, though my martyrdom may last a million years. I made this appeal and held my peace. There was a full minute of unbroken silence, and again another drop fell, but I knew with infinite unshakable certainty that everything would change immediately. And behold, my grave suddenly was rent asunder. That is, I don't know whether it was opened or dug up, but I was caught up by some dark and unknown being, and we found ourselves in space. I suddenly regained my sight. It was the dead of night, and never, never had there been such darkness. We were flying through space far away from the earth. I did not question the being who was talking to me. I was proud and waited. I assured myself that I was not afraid and was thrilled with ecstasy at the thought that I was not afraid. I do not know how long we were flying. I cannot imagine. It happened as it always does in dreams when you skip over space and time and the laws of thought and existence, and only pause upon the points for which the heart yearns. I remember that I suddenly saw in the darkness a star. Is that serious? I asked impulsively, though I had not meant to ask any questions. No, that is the star you saw between the clouds when you were coming home. The being who was carrying me replied, I knew that it had something like a human face. Strange to say, I did not like that being. In fact, I felt an intense aversion for it. I had expected complete non-existence, and that was why I had put a bullet through my heart. And here I was, in the hands of a creature not human, of course, but yet living, existing. And so there is life beyond the grave. I thought with the strange frivolity one has in dreams— but in its inmost depth my heart remained unchanged. And if I have got to exist again, I thought, and live once more under the control of some irresistible power, I won't be vanquished and humiliated. You know that I am afraid of you and despise me for that, I said suddenly to my companion, unable to refrain from the humiliating question which implied a confession, and feeling my humiliation stab my heart as with a pin. He did not answer my question, but all at once I felt that he was not even despising me, but was laughing at me and had no compassion for me, and that our journey had an unknown and mysterious object that concerned me only. Fear was growing in my heart. Something was mutely and painfully communicated to me from my silent companion, and permeated my whole being. 
we were flying through dark, unknown space. I had for some time lost sight of the constellations familiar to my eyes. I knew that there were stars in the heavenly spaces, the light of which took thousands or millions of years to reach the earth. Perhaps we were already flying through those spaces. I expected something with a terrible anguish that tortured my heart, and suddenly I was thrilled by a familiar feeling that stirred me to the depths. I suddenly caught sight of our sun. I knew that it could not be our sun that gave life to our earth and that we were an infinite distance from our sun. But for some reason I knew in my whole being that it was a sun exactly like ours, a duplicate of it. A sweet, thrilling feeling resounded with ecstasy in my heart. The kindred power of the same light which had given me light stirred an echo in my heart and awakened it, and I had a sensation of life, the old life of the past, for the first time since I had been in the grave. But... "'If that is the sun, if that is exactly the same as our sun,' I cried, "'where is the earth?' And my companion pointed to a star twinkling in the distance with an emerald light. We were flying straight toward it. "'And are such repetitions possible in the universe? Can that be the law of nature? And if that is an earth there, can it be just the same earth as ours, just the same, as poor as unhappy, but precious and beloved forever, arousing in the most ungrateful of her children the same poignant love for her that we feel for our earth? I cried out, shaken by irresistible ecstatic love for the old familiar earth which I had left. The image of the poor child whom I had repulsed flashed through my mind. You shall see it all answered my companion, and there was a note of sorrow in his voice. But we were rapidly approaching the planet. It was growing before my eyes. I could already distinguish the ocean, the outline of Europe, and suddenly a feeling of a great and holy jealousy glowed in my heart. How can it be repeated? And what for? I love and can love only that earth which I have left stained with my blood when in my ingratitude I quenched my life with a bullet in my heart. But I have never, never ceased to love that earth, and perhaps on the very night I parted from it I loved it more than ever. Is there suffering upon this new earth? On our earth we can only love with suffering and through suffering. We cannot love otherwise, and we know no other sort of love. I want suffering in order to love. I long, I thirst, this very instant to kiss with tears the earth that I have left, and I don't want, I, I won't accept life on any other. But my companion had already left me. I suddenly, quite without noticing how, found myself on this other earth, in the bright light of a sunny day fair as paradise. I believe I was standing on one of the islands that make up, on our globe, the Greek archipelago, or on the coast of the mainland facing that archipelago. Oh, everything was exactly as it is with us, only everything seemed to have a festive radiance, the splendor of some great holy triumph attained at last. The caressing sea, green as emerald, splashed softly upon the shore and kissed it with manifest, almost conscious love. The tall, lovely trees stood in all the glory of their blossom, and their innumerable leaves greeted me, I am certain, with their soft caressing rustle and seemed to articulate words of love. The grass glowed with bright and fragrant flowers. Birds were flying in flocks in the air and perched fearlessly on my shoulders and arms and joyfully struck me with their darling fluttering wings. And at last I saw and knew the people of this happy land. They came to me of themselves. They surrounded me kissed me. The children of the sun. The children of their sun. Oh, how beautiful they were. Never had I seen on our own earth such beauty in mankind. Only perhaps in our children in their earliest years one might find some remote, faint reflection of this beauty. The eyes of these happy people shone with a clear brightness, their faces were radiant with the light of reason and fullness of a serenity that comes of perfect understanding. 
but those faces were gay. In their words and voices there was a note of childlike joy. Oh, from the first moment, from the first glance at them, I understood it all. It was the earth untarnished by the fall. On it lived people who had not sinned. They lived it just in such a paradise as that in which, according to all the legends of mankind, our first parents lived before they sinned. The only difference was that all this earth was the same paradise. These people, laughing joyfully, thronged round me and caressed me. They took me home with them, and each of them tried to reassure me. Oh, they asked me no questions, but they seemed, I fancied, to know everything without asking, and they wanted to make haste and smooth away the signs of suffering from my face. 4. And do you know what? Well, granted that it was only a dream, yet the sensation of the love of those innocent and beautiful people has remained with me for ever, and I feel as though their love is still flowing out to me from over there. I have seen them myself, have known them and been convinced. I loved them. I suffered for them afterwards. Oh, I understood at once, even at the time, that in many things I could not understand them at all, as an up-to-date Russian progressive and contemptible Petersburger, it struck me as inexplicable that knowing so much, they had, for instance, no science like ours. But I soon realized that their knowledge was gained and fostered by intuitions different from those of us on earth, and that their aspirations, too, were quite different. They desired nothing and were at peace. They did not aspire to knowledge of life as we aspire to understand it, because their lives were full. But their knowledge was higher and deeper than ours, for our science seeks to explain what life is, aspires to understand it in order to teach others how to live, while they, without science, knew how to live, and that I understood. But I could not understand their knowledge. They showed me their trees, and I could not understand the intense love with which they looked at them. It was as though they were talking with creatures like themselves. And perhaps I shall not be mistaken if I say that they conversed with them. Yes, they had found their language, and I am convinced that the trees understood them. They looked at all nature like that, at the animals who lived in peace with them and did not attack them but loved them conquered by their love. They pointed to the stars and told me something about them which I could not understand, but I am convinced that they were somehow in touch with the stars, not only in thought but by some living channel. Oh, these people did not persist in trying to make me understand them. They loved me without that. But I knew that they would never understand me, and so I hardly spoke to them about our earth. I only kissed in their presence the earth on which they lived, and mutely worshipped them themselves, and they saw that and let me worship them without being abashed at my adoration, for they, themselves, loved much. They were not unhappy on my account when at times I kissed their feet with tears, joyfully conscious of the love with which they would respond to mine. At times I asked myself with wonder how it was they were able never to offend a creature like me, and never once to arouse a feeling of jealousy or envy in me. Often I wondered how it could be that, boastful and untruthful as I was, I never talked to them of what I knew, of which, of course, they had no notion— that I was never tempted to do so by a desire to astonish, or even to benefit them. They were as gay and sportive as children. They wandered about their lovely woods and copses. They sang their lovely songs. Their fare was light, the fruits of their trees, the honey from their woods, and the milk of the animals who loved them. The work they did for food and raiment was brief and not laborious. They loved and begot children, but I never noticed in them the impulse of that cruel sensuality which overcomes almost every man on this earth, all and each, and is the source of almost every sin of mankind on earth. 
They rejoiced at the arrival of children as new beings to share their happiness. There was no quarreling, no jealousy among them, and they did not even know what the words meant. Their children were the children of all, for they all made up one family. There was scarcely any illness among them, though there was death. But their old people died peacefully, as though falling asleep, giving blessings and smiles to those who surrounded them to take their last farewell with bright and loving smiles. I never saw grief or tears on those occasions, but only love, which reached the point of ecstasy, but a calm ecstasy, made perfect and contemplative. One might think that they were still in contact with the departed after death, and that their earthly union was not cut short by death. They scarcely understood me when I questioned them about immortality, but evidently they were so convinced of it without reasoning that it was not for them a question at all. They had no temples, but they had a real, living, and uninterrupted sense of oneness with the whole of the universe. They had no creed, but they had a certain knowledge that when their earthly joy had reached the limits of earthly nature, then there would come for them, for the living and for the dead, a still greater fullness of contact with the whole of the universe. They looked forward to that moment with joy, but without haste, not pining for it, but seeming to have a foretaste of it in their hearts, of which they talked to one another. In the evening before going to sleep they liked singing in musical and harmonious chorus. In those songs they expressed all the sensations that the parting day had given them, sang its glories and took leave of it. They sang the praises of nature, of the sea, of the woods. They liked making songs about one another and praised each other like children. They were the simplest songs, but they sprang from their hearts and went to one's heart. And not only in their songs, but in all their lives, they seemed to do nothing but admire one another. It was like being in love with each other, but in all-embracing, universal feeling. Some of their songs, solemn and rapturous, I scarcely understood at all. Though I understood the words, I could never fathom their full significance. It remained, as it were, beyond the grasp of my mind yet my heart unconsciously absorbed it more and more. I often told them that I had had a presentiment of it long before, that this joy and glory had come to me on our earth in the form of a yearning melancholy that at times approached insufferable sorrow, that I had had a foreknowledge of them all and of their glory in the dreams of my heart and the visions of my mind, that often on our earth I could not look at the setting sun without tears, that in my hatred for the men of our earth there was always a yearning anguish. Why could I not hate them without loving them? Why could I not help forgiving them? And in my love for them there was a yearning grief. Why could I not love them without hating them? They listened to me, and I saw they could not conceive what I was saying, but I did not regret that I had spoken to them of it. I knew that they understood the intensity of my yearning anguish over those whom I had left. But when they looked at me with their sweet eyes full of love, when I felt that in their presence my heart too became as innocent and just as theirs, the feeling of the fullness of life took my breath away, and I worshipped them in silence. Oh, everyone laughs in my face now and assures me that one cannot dream of such details as I am telling now that I only dreamed or felt one sensation that arose in my heart in delirium and made up the details myself when I woke up. And when I told them that perhaps it really was so, my God, how they shouted with laughter in my face and what mirth I caused! <laughs> yes, of course I was overcome by the mere sensation of my dream, and that was all that was preserved in my cruelly wounded heart, but the actual forms and images of my dreams— that is, the very ones I really saw at the very time of my dream were filled with such harmony, were so lovely and enchanting, and were so actual, that on awakening I was, of course, incapable of clothing them in our poor language, so that they were bound to become blurred in my mind, and so perhaps I really was forced afterwards to make up the details, and so, of course, to distort them in my passionate desire to convey some at least of them as quickly as I could. 
but on the other hand, how can I help believing that it was all true? It was perhaps a thousand times brighter, happier, and more joyful than I describe it. Granted that I dreamed it, yet it must have been real. You know, I will tell you a secret. Perhaps it was not a dream at all. For then something happened so awful, something so horribly true, that it could not have been imagined in my dream. My heart may have originated the dream, but would my heart alone have been capable of originating the awful event which happened to me afterwards? How could I alone have invented it or imagined it in my dream? Could my petty heart and my fickle, trivial mind have risen to such a revelation of truth? Oh, judge for yourselves. Hitherto I have concealed it, but now I will tell the truth. The fact is that I corrupted them all. 5. Yes. Yes. It ended in my corrupting them all. How could it come to pass? I do not know. But I remember it clearly. The dream embraced thousands of years and left in me only a sense of the whole. I only know that I was the cause of their sin and downfall. Like a vile trichina, like a germ of the plague infecting whole kingdoms, so I contaminated all this earth so happy and sinless before my coming. They learnt to lie, grew fond of lying, and discovered the charm of falsehood. Oh, at first perhaps it began innocently with a jest, coquetry, with amorous play, perhaps indeed with a germ, but that germ of falsity made its way into their hearts and pleased them. Then sensuality was soon begotten, sensuality begot jealousy, jealousy, cruelty, I don't know, I don't remember, but soon, very soon, the first blood was shed. They marveled and were horrified, and began to be split up and divided. They formed into unions, but it was against one another. Reproaches, upbraidings followed. They came to no shame, and shame brought them to virtue. The conception of honor sprang up, and every union began waving its flags. They began torturing animals, and the animals withdrew from them into the forest and became hostile to them. They began to struggle for separation, for isolation, for individuality, for mine and thine. They began to talk in different languages, they became acquainted with sorrow and loved sorrow. They thirsted for suffering and said that truth could only be attained through suffering. Then science appeared. As they became wicked, they began talking of brotherhood and humanitarianism and understood those ideas. As they became criminal, they invented justice and drew up whole legal codes in order to observe it and to ensure their being kept. Set up a guillotine. They hardly remembered what they had lost, and in fact refused to believe that they had ever been happy and innocent. They even laughed at the possibility of this happiness in the past and called it a dream. They could not even imagine it in definite form and shape, but strange and wonderful to relate, though they lost all faith in their past happiness and called it a legend. They so longed to be happy and innocent once more, that they succumbed to this desire like children, made an idol of it, set up temples and worshipped their own idea, their own desire, though at the same time they fully believed that it was unattainable and could not be realized, yet they bowed down to it and adored it with tears. Nevertheless, if it could have happened that they had returned to the innocent and happy condition which they had lost— and if someone had shown it to them again, and had asked them whether they wanted to go back to it, they would certainly have refused. They answered me. We may be deceitful, wicked, and unjust. We know it, and weep over it. We grieve over it. We torment and punish ourselves more, perhaps, than that merciful judge who will judge us and whose name we know not. But we have science.' 
and by means of it we shall find the truth and we shall arrive at it consciously. Knowledge is higher than feeling. The consciousness of life is higher than life. Science will give us wisdom. Wisdom will reveal the laws, and the knowledge of the laws of happiness is higher than happiness. That is what they said. And after saying such things, everyone began to love himself better than anyone else. And indeed, they could not do otherwise. All became so jealous of the rights of their own personality that they did their very utmost to curtail and destroy them in others, and made that the chief thing in their lives. Slavery followed, even voluntary slavery. The weak eagerly submitted to the strong on condition that the latter aided them to subdue the still weaker. Then there were saints who came to these people, weeping and talked to them of their pride, of their loss of harmony and due proportion of their loss of shame. They were laughed at or pelted with stones. Holy blood was shed on the threshold of the temples. Then there arose men who began to think how to bring all people together again, so that everybody, while still loving himself best of all, might not interfere with others, and all might live together in something like a harmonious society. Regular wars sprang up over this idea. All the combatants at the same time firmly believed that science, wisdom, and the instinct of self-preservation would force men at last to unite into a harmonious and rational society, and so meanwhile to hasten matters, the wise endeavored to exterminate as rapidly as possible all who were not wise, and did not understand their idea that the latter might not hinder its triumph. But the instinct of self-preservation grew rapidly weaker. There arose men, haughty and sensual, who demanded all or nothing. In order to obtain everything, they resorted to crime, and if they did not succeed, to suicide." There arose religions with a cult of non-existence and self-destruction for the sake of the everlasting peace of annihilation. At last these people grew weary of their meaningless toil, and signs of suffering came into their faces, and then they proclaimed that suffering was a beauty, for in suffering alone was their meaning. They glorified suffering in their songs. I moved about among them, wringing my hands and weeping over them, but I loved them perhaps more than in old days when there was no suffering in their faces, and when they were innocent and so lovely. I loved the earth. They had polluted even more than when it had been a paradise, if only because sorrow had come to it. Alas, I always loved sorrow and tribulation, but only for myself, for myself. But I wept over them, pitying them. I stretched out my hands to them in despair, blaming, cursing, and despising myself. I told them that all this was my doing, mine alone, that it was I had brought them to corruption, contamination, and falsity. I besought them to crucify me. I taught them how to make a cross. I could not kill myself. I had not the strength, but I wanted to suffer at their hands. I yearned for their suffering. I longed that my blood should be drained to the last drop in these agonies. But they only laughed at me, and began at last to look upon me as crazy. They justified me. They declared that they had only got what they wanted themselves, and that all that now was could not have been otherwise. At last they declared to me that I was becoming dangerous and that they should lock me up in a madhouse if I did not hold my tongue. Then such grief took possession of my soul that my heart was wrung, and I felt as though I were dying. And then, then I awoke. It was morning, that is, it was not yet daylight, but about six o'clock. I woke up in the same armchair. My candle had burnt out. Everyone was asleep in the captain's room, and there was a stillness all around, rare in our flat. First of all, I leapt up in great amazement. 
Nothing like this had ever happened to me before, not even in the most trivial detail. I had never, for instance, fallen asleep like this in my armchair. While I was standing and coming to myself, I suddenly caught sight of my revolver laying loaded, ready. But instantly I thrust it away. Oh, now, life, life! I lifted up my hands and called upon eternal truth, not with words, but with tears. Ecstasy, immeasurable ecstasy, flooded my soul. Yes, life and spreading the good tidings. Oh, I at that moment resolved to spread the tidings, and resolved it, of course, for my whole life. I go to spread the tidings. I want to spread the tidings. Of what? Of the truth. For I have seen it, have seen it with my own eyes, have seen it in all its glory. And since then I have been preaching. Moreover, I love all those who laugh at me more than any of the rest. Why that is so, I do not know and cannot explain, but so be it. I am told that I am vague and confused, and if I am vague and confused now, what shall I be later on? It is true indeed. I am vague and confused, and perhaps as time goes on I shall be more so. And, of course, I shall make many blunders before I find out how to preach, that is, find out what words to say, what things to do, for it is a very difficult task. I see all that as clear as daylight. But listen, who does not make mistakes? And yet you know all are making for the same goal, all are striving in the same direction anyway, from the sage to the lowest robber, only by different roads. It is an old truth, but this is what is new. I cannot go far wrong, for I have seen the truth. I have seen and I know that people can be beautiful and happy without losing the power of living on earth. I will not and cannot believe that evil is the normal condition of mankind— and it is just this faith of mine that they laugh at. But how can I help believing it? I have seen the truth. It is not as though I had invented it with my mind. I have seen it, seen it, and the living image of it has filled my soul forever. I have seen it in such full perfection that I cannot believe that it is impossible for people to have it. And so, how can I go wrong? I shall make some slips, no doubt, and shall perhaps talk in second-hand language, but not for long. The living image of what I saw will always be with me, and will always correct and guide me. Oh, I am full of courage and freshness, and I will go on and on if it were for a thousand years. Do you know? At first I meant to conceal the fact that I corrupted them, but that was a mistake. That was my first mistake. But truth whispered to me that I was lying, and preserved me and corrected me. But how establish paradise? I don't know, because I do not know how to put it into words. After my dream I lost command of words, all the chief words anyway, the most necessary ones. But never mind. I shall go and I shall keep talking. I won't leave off, for anyway I have seen it with my own eyes, though I cannot describe what I saw. But the scoffers do not understand that. It was a dream, they say. Delirium, hallucination, <laughs> as though that meant so much. And they are so proud. A dream. What is a dream? And is not our life a dream? I will say more. Suppose that this paradise will never come to pass. That I understand. Yet I shall go on preaching it. And yet how simple it is. In one day, in one hour, everything could be arranged at once. The chief thing is to love others like yourself. That's the great thing, and that's everything. Nothing else is wanted. You will find out at once how to arrange it all. And yet it's an old truth which has been told and retold a billion times. But it has not formed part of our lives. The consciousness of life is higher than life. The knowledge of the laws of happiness is higher than happiness. That is what one must contend against, and I shall. If only everyone wants it, it can all be arranged at once. 
and I tracked out that little girl. And I shall go on and on. 